Laura Middleton, her brother and her lover, Saint Kitts, 1890. The remarks which Emily had made regarding the share Laura Middleton had had in opening up her ideas one. The subject of the mysteries in which she had now been fully initiated had not escaped my observation. It so happened that at that very time I was under an engagement to pay a visit to the Middletons, who were very distant relations of my mother. It of course occurred to me that it was possible I might be able to turn the information I had thus acquired to some account. Laura and I were old friends. She was about two years older than I, a very handsome, fine-looking girl, but as I had then fancied, upon rather a larger scale than quite suited my taste. We had always been on very good terms as children, but she had a sort of haughty, imperious air, which, joined to the difference in our ages, had operated in a manner that would have prevented me from thinking of taking any liberties with her, and she was about the last person in the world I should have been disposed to imagine, addicted to the amusements in which Emily had participated with her. When I again met her on arriving at their country seat, I found that a considerable change had taken place in her person. But probably this was merely the natural result that the preceding two years, during which I had not seen her, had worked upon a girl at her time of life. By fully developing the proportions and finding down the parts of the figure which, at an earlier period, might have appeared too prominent. I, too, had grown considerably during this period, more so in proportion than she had, and now her height by no means appeared to me to be too great, and, altogether, I could not help acknowledging to myself that I had rarely seen a handsomer or finer-looking woman. She still retained somewhat of her haughty air, though softened down, and I could hardly fancy. When looking at her, that Emily's account of her behavior in the hours when she gave herself up to enjoyment could be true. I soon, however, became aware of circumstances that tended to corroborate the tale, and which put me in the way of making advances to her, which I hastened to do. When it came to be time to dress for dinner, Lady Middleton said to me that she had presumed on our relationship to put me into the family wing of the house. As the arrival of some unexpected visitors had made her change the destination of the room she had previously intended for me, she said she had no doubt I would find the one set apart for me quite comfortable. For the only objection to it, and which prevented her from being able to put a stranger into it, was that it opened into another room, which would have to be occupied by her son, Frank, who was expected home from school in a short time. This last room in consequence of some alterations made in building an addition to the house, had no separate entrance, but opened into the two rooms on each side, and as the one on the other side was occupied by his sister and aunt, Frank would have to enter through mine. She said I must keep him in order and make him behave himself, and if I had any trouble with him to let her know. I had not seen my young namesake for about two years, but I recollected him as a fine, high-spirited, very handsome boy about twelve or thirteen years of age, always getting into some scrape or other, and always getting out of them somehow in such a fearless, good-humored manner that it was impossible for anyone to be angry with him. So I said I should be delighted to renew my acquaintance with my young friend, and that I had not the least doubt but that we should get on very pleasantly. On going to my room to dress for dinner, I found a servant girl engaged in making some of the arrangements which the change of apartments had necessitated. On my entrance she was going to leave the room, but seeing that she was a very nice-looking young girl, I said she need not run away in such a hurry, that surely she was not afraid of me. She gave me an arch look as if taking the measure of my capacities, and replied with a smile that she did not think she need be afraid of such a nice-looking young gentleman. This, I thought, was a fair challenge and it induced me to take a better look at her. I found she was a very well-made country girl of about nineteen, with some very promising points about her. I therefore kept her in conversation for a short time, while I went on with my washing operation. Finding she was in no hurry to leave me, I went up to her as she was engaged in putting the bed in order, and snatched a few kisses. I then commenced playing with her bubbles and taking some further liberties with her. As my proceedings met with very little resistance, beyond a few exclamations of oh for shame, I did not expect such conduct from you. 
I proceeded with my researches, and without much difficulty, I succeeded in raising her petticoats and getting possession of her stronghold. On insinuating my finger within it, I found it to be tighter and even more inviting than I had anticipated. She soon became excited with my caresses and the titillation which my finger kept up without her fortress, and I succeeded in laying her upon the bed and throwing up her clothes so as to disclose it fairly to my view wall. I found a fine, fresh, white belly and a pair of plump, handsome thighs with a very pretty little opening tolerably well shaded with light brown hair. Altogether, it was a very desirable prospect, and I thought that failing anything better I might manage to find a good deal of enjoyment in her charms. Slipping off my trousers, therefore, I jumped up beside her on the bed, and throwing my arms round her, I got upon her and attempted to introduce myself into the fortress. But here I found greater resistance than I had anticipated from her previous conduct. I had observed, however, the effect my caresses had produced on her senses. I thought the best plan would be to endeavor to excite them still more. So, insinuating the finger of one hand again into the critical spot, and with the other drawing my shirt over my head so as to leave myself entirely naked, I raised myself on my knees beside her, exhibiting my standard fully erected, flaming fiercely before her eyes. While continuing to excite her by the movements of my finger, I said I was sure she would not be cruel enough to refuse me, but would take pity upon the little suppliant that was begging so hard for admittance. Taking hold of her hand, I placed it upon the stiff object and made her grasp it as it throbbed and beat with the excitement under which I was laboring. Her eyes were fixed upon the lovely object thus exposed to her gaze, and I could easily see from the flushing of her face and the sparkling of her eyes what a powerful impression I had made upon her. All she said was, Oh, but if John should know of it, I immediately replied, But why should John know anything about it? You don't suppose I am such a mean wretch as to tell anybody of what we may do. And if you only keep your own secrets, no one need ever know anything about it. But, perhaps, I continued, you think this little gentleman, and I shoved the furious member backwards and forwards two or three times in her hand, as she, still continued to grasp it, is not so big as John's and won't give you so much pleasure. But only let me try and I shall do all I can to pleasure you. Oh no, it is not that, said she hastily, squeezing the little object convulsively in her grasp. And as I bent down to kiss her, she whispered, I can't resist you any longer, but you must bolt the door. And if anybody comes, I can get away through Miss Loris' room. She won't tell anything I can easily make her keep quiet. This speech not a little astonished me, for from what I knew of Laura I thought she was the last person in the world to make a confidante of her waiting maid. But I was aware that this was not the moment to expect any explanation. So I jumped out of bed, bolted the door, and speedily returned to the charge, when I found that the opposing party had given up all idea of defense, and was quite ready to meet my advances. Stretching herself out in the most favorable position, she allowed me again to mount upon her, and taking hold of the instrument of love, she herself guided it to the proper quarter. To my surprise, however, the entrance was much more difficult than I had expected, and I soon found that I had overrated Master. John's capacities and that the fortress, though not a maiden one, had not previously been entered by so large a besieging force. With some little exertion on my part, aided by every means in her power, though she winced a good deal at the pain I put her to, I at length succeeded in effecting my object, and penetrated, to a depth which from her exclamation of delight when she found me fairly embedded within her, and from certain other symptoms, I felt certain had never been reached previously. Once fairly established within my new quarter, we mutually exerted our utmost endeavors to gratify each other as well as ourselves, and the result of our efforts soon led, much to the satisfaction of both parties, in the temporary subjugation of both the contending forces. Gratified by finding that the issue had been much more satisfactory than I had expected, and not having had an opportunity for some time previously of indulging myself so agreeably. 
I, much to her surprise and joy, retained possession of the stronghold, with my forces so slightly weakened by their late defeat as to give immediate promise of a renewed attack. Telling her to be still for a few minutes and that we should shortly enjoy ourselves again, I began to question her regarding the matters in which I felt interested. I thought it better at first not to allude to Laura, so I commenced by inquiring about John, and I soon found that the one subject led to the other. It appeared that John was the undergroom whose duty it was to attend upon Miss Laura when she rode out. John had courted Betsy for some time previously, and had been admitted to all the privileges of a husband on condition that he should marry her as soon as he could obtain a situation which would enable him to support her. Betsy, it seems, was rather jealous, and John, to tease her, had pretended that he was on terms of intimacy with his young mistress, a statement for which there was not the slightest foundation. Betsy's suspicions, however, being once roused, were not easily set at rest, and this led her to pay more attention than previously to her young mistress' proceedings. She had sometimes wondered what induced Laura to go out by herself almost every morning before breakfast and now fancying that it might be for the purpose of meeting John, she resolved to watch her and ascertain if her suspicions were correct. She accordingly followed her, and found that she invariably made her way to a small summer house at a little distance from the house. Here John never made his appearance, but, curious to know what Laura was about, Betsy continued her spying until she one day ascertained that, instead of amusing herself with John's article, Miss Laura resorted to the place for the purpose of consoling herself with a very insufficient substitute for what Betsy had suspected to be the offending member. As Laura slept in the same room with her aunt, she had no opportunity of thus indulging herself. I drew all this gradually from her, leading her on by degrees, and trying to make it appear that I had no particular interest in the subject. Her story, however, had such an effect upon a certain part of my body— which was still embedded within her, that she could not help feeling as she proceeded with her tale, the impression it made upon me. Indeed, when she came to relate the discovery she had made, I was obliged to stop her and proceed to a repetition of our enjoyment in order to allay the fire which had been so fiercely lighted up within me. When I had brought the second engagement to a still more satisfactory conclusion than the first, I found it was time for me to get on with my dressing so as not to be too late for dinner, and Betsy volunteered her services to assist as valet. The lewd little monkey, however, was too intent upon examining the course from which she had derived so much pleasure to do anything except fondle and caress it, and seeing the pleasure it evidently gave her, I allowed her to do as she liked. While she amused herself with tickling and squeezing the accessories, handling the principal object, kissing it, inserting it in her mouth and sucking it, and doing everything in her power to restore it to the imposing attitude which had pleased her so much. I endeavored with as much apparent unconcern as I could assume to ascertain every particular as to Laura. Betsy, however, was too quick not to discover what I was after, and said to me, Come, come, I see quite well how it is with you, you. We like this pretty little gentleman I am playing with to take the place of its substitute between Miss Laura's thighs. Oh, you need not try to deceive May felt how it swelled up within me whenever I mentioned her name, and how firm and stiff it grew when I told you what I had seen. Well, it would be almost a pity not to let you take compassion upon her. It is very hard she should be reduced to such a miserable contrivance when she might have such a delicious charmer as this to amuse herself with. But I'm afraid you would have some difficulty in getting it in, more than you had with me. Why her little plaything is not much bigger than my finger, even John's, though it is not near so big as this, is better than it. But as for this wicked fellow, I can hardly grasp it in my hand, and I don't see how you will ever be able to make it enter into such a little chink as she has. However, I dare say you will be able to manage it somehow. Come. I shall make a bargain with you if you will take John as your groom, so as to let us be married before my belly gets big, as I am afraid it will do after. This naughty fellow has been into it. I shall do all I can to enable you to enjoy, Miss Laura, and I have no doubt we shall soon find means to accomplish it. What do you say? 
I replied that I was afraid such an arrangement would hardly answer. In the first place, I could not turn away my present servant. And secondly, I was afraid that if John were in my service, he might perhaps be apt to be jealous of his master. She laughed and said that would never do. She, however, soon came to an agreement that I should exert myself to find a better situation for John, and I promised her that if I succeeded with Laura, she should make her a present of fifty pounds as a wedding gift on condition that she acted in all respects as I desired and exerted herself to promote my object and conceal our proceedings from everyone. She stipulated that she was sometimes to have the enjoyment of the charming article, which she still continued to fondle, and this I willingly promised. But I warned her that she must be very careful, that her mistress should not suspect our intercourse in the least. As I was quite sure from what I knew of her proud disposition, it would ruin all my hopes, as she would never consent to be the rival of her waiting maid. I easily satisfied her that even for her own sake, the utmost caution was absolutely necessary. And having now obtained all the information she could give me and the dinner bell ringing, I hastened to the drawing room. If I had perceived an alteration in Laura's appearance, she had evidently been no less struck with the sea. Change that had taken place in my person, and she expressed her surprise at my having grown so much. I fancied I could perceive that there was some curiosity to ascertain what was the extent of the change which had taken place in a certain quarter, and I caught her eyes more than once glancing in a direction where she must have perceived symptoms of a growth at least corresponding to that of the other parts of my body. I was induced to think that she was by no means displeased with the discovery from her manner towards me, which instead of being as formerly haughty and condescending, was now frank and friendly. On entering the drawing room, I found that Sir Hugh had not yet made his appearance, and that it would still be a few minutes before we went to dinner. I was conscious that the fingering which Betsy had kept up during the whole time I was dressing had again raised a flame in me, which I had not had time to quench, and I turned into the music room to take advantage of the few minutes to calm myself down, that I might not make an exhibition before the rest of the party. Lara had observed me and thinking that the movement arose from shyness at meeting a party of comparative strangers, she came to me and entered into conversation. The charms of her person, more especially after all that had just passed with Betsy regarding her, again raised the flame to an even greater height than before, and the effect was plainly visible through a pair of thin trousers. I soon saw by her heightened color that the consequences were not unobserved by her. I was afraid at first that she might be annoyed by so open a demonstration of the effects of her charms. But to my great delight she showed no symptom of being offended, but continued to converse with me and, I thought, rather enjoyed the confusion which the rampantness of the offending member at first occasioned me. Finding this to be the case, I soon recovered my self-possession, and being desirous to make as great an impression on her senses as possible. I placed myself so that I could not be observed by any of the party in the drawing room, and instead of attempting to conceal it, I allowed the protuberance in front to become even more prominent, indeed so much so, as to enable her to form a pretty accurate idea of its size and shape. She took no notice of this, but I knew it could not escape her observation. When a general move was made to the dining room, she took my arm and said that, as I was a stranger, I must allow her to take charge of me, until I became a little better acquainted with the company. I willingly assented, and for the rest of the evening I attached myself to her. Without attempting to take any liberties with her, I omitted no opportunity of letting her see the full effect of her beauty and charms upon my senses. The next morning I was up early and on the lookout. From Betsy's description, I had not been able exactly to understand how I could manage to surprise Laura during her amusement, and I determined to watch and follow her and be guided by circumstances. Sometime before the breakfast hour I saw her leave the house by a side door and proceed through a part of the park which was a good deal shaded with trees. I took advantage of the shelter thus afforded me to trace her steps, unperceived, until I came in sight of the summer house. But to my dismay... I found that it was impossible to follow her any further without being discovered. The building was circular, 
consisting of woodwork to the height of about four feet and above that glass all round. It was situated in the center of a flower plot of considerable extent in which the bushes were kept down, and not allowed to attain any size. It was therefore admirably adapted for the purpose to which it had been applied, as no one approaching it could well see what passed within. While the party in the interior could command an uninterrupted view all round and discover any intruder at some distance, I was quite aware that it was most important to avoid giving her any alarm, or making her suspect I had any idea of her proceedings, and I resolved not to attempt to approach her that morning. So, selecting a tree which was situated in such a manner as to command a complete view of the summer house, I swung myself up into it and soon gained a position from which, with the assistance of a small telescope I had taken with me, I could obtain a good view of her proceedings. I very soon discovered that Betsy's story was perfectly correct. She had apparently no time to spare, for, taking out the little instrument from its place of concealment, she seated herself on a couch from which she could command a view of the approach from the house. Then, extending her thighs, she drew up her petticoats and, inserting the counterfeit article in the appropriate place, began her career of mock pleasure. I watched all her proceedings with the greatest enjoyment, and such was the effect produced upon me that I could not help following her example. I drew forth my excited member, and as she thrust the little bijou in and out of the delicious cavity in which I so longed to replace it with a better substitute, I responded to every movement of her hand by an up-and-down friction upon the ivory pillar, with such effect that when she sunk back upon the couch after having procured for herself as much pleasure as such a makeshift could afford, I felt the corresponding efforts produce a similar effect upon my own excited reality, which, throbbing and beating furiously, sent forth a delicious shower of liquid bliss. I allowed her to get up and return to the house without her perceiving me. And when we met at breakfast, she was not even aware I had been out. The day passed very pleasantly. She was evidently flattered with the devotion I showed her, and seemed always indisposed to try to what length her encouragement might carry me, probably thinking that she could at any time check my advances should they become too forward. In the course of the day, I again visited the summer house, and ascertained that I had no chance of surprising her there without making some alteration in it, which it would take a little time to effect, but which I resolved to have made if I found I could not succeed otherwise. In the meantime, I resolved to try the effect of a bold stroke. Getting up early the next morning, I proceeded directly to the summer house and waited there till she made her appearance. Having made certain that she was alone, I stretched myself on the couch as nearly as possible in the attitude she had assumed the previous morning. I then unbuttoned my trousers and drew them down below my knees, and at the same time turned up my shirt above my waist, thus exhibiting the whole forepart of my person entirely naked. Then grasping my stiffly erected weapon in my hand, I exhibited myself performing the same operation which I had witnessed her, engaged in the previous morning. She came in without the least suspicion and, on entering a place, had at once a full view of my nearly naked figure extended, at full length on the couch, and engaged in performing an operation the nature of which she could not possibly misunderstand. She seemed struck with astonishment so much that she remained motionless for more than a minute, during which I watched her with intense curiosity. Her face and neck, so far as visible, flushed till they were almost of a purple hue, and her eyes were fixed upon the stiffly erected column up and down which my hand was gently moving. I was in great hopes that the sight had produced the effect I desired. But no. Suddenly recovering herself, she exclaimed, for shame, sir, and turning away hastily left the place before I had time to rise and interrupt her. I would fain have followed her and tried to induce her to return, but I would not allow my passions to carry me so far as to do what what might injure her irreparably in the event of anyone being about the grounds and seeing me in the condition in which I then was. Before I could replace my dress so as to be able to venture out, she had gone so far that she had reached the house ere I could make up to her. When we met at breakfast, she took no notice of what had passed, nor could I discover any difference in her manner to me, beyond her heightened color when we exchanged the morning greeting as if we had not met before. 
but she carefully avoided any opportunity of our being left alone. Though I could sometimes detect her eyes glancing towards me when she thought she was not observed, and more particularly in the direction of the part of which she had obtained a first glance that morning. Having gone so far with her, I was determined to try at least whether I could not get a little farther. So in the evening when a dance was got up, I asked her to waltz with me in such an open manner that she could not easily make any excuse for not doing so. As soon as I got an opportunity of saying a few words unheard, I whispered to her, Come, come, Lara. This is too bad of you to be offended at me for doing the very same thing I saw you doing in the same place yesterday morning. In an instant, her face turned perfectly scarlet, and then as pale as death, and I am certain she would have fallen to the ground had I not supported her. In a few seconds she recovered herself a little, and in a suppressed but earnest tone she whispered, Hush, hush, for God's sake. I led her out of the room into the conservatory and pressed her to sit down on a bench. She objected to this, saying, Not here, not here, pointing at the same time to the door at the opposite side leading into a rosary, which was not overlooked from the drawing room. I there placed her on a seat and sat down beside her and waited for a few minutes, till her emotion should subside, finding that she was still quite overcome and remained silent, trembling, and evidently greatly agitated by the discovery that her secret was known to me. I said to her, Laura, dearest, you need not be in the least alarmed. Your secret is quite safe with me, and nothing shall ever induce me to say a word to anyone regarding it. Nor need you fear, my own darling, that I shall take advantage of it to make you do anything you don't like. She made no reply, but at the same time she offered no resistance to the caresses I ventured to bestow upon her and I even fancied that the warm kiss I imprinted on her lips was faintly returned. I went on to say, I cannot tell you what bliss it would give me if you would only allow this little charmer to take his proper place, instead of the wretched substitute I so much envied yesterday. I am quite sure it would give you as much pleasure as it would me, and at the same time, while I supported her with one arm round her waist, I placed her hand upon the object to which I drew her attention, and which, throbbing fiercely, lay extended along my thigh. Emboldened by her allowing her hand to remain upon it, I unbuttoned a few buttons and removed my shirt, when out it started stiff and erect as a piece of ivory. When I again placed her hand upon it, I felt it grasped with convulsive eagerness. Excited beyond measure by this, I slipped my hand under her dress, bringing it up along her thighs until it reached the object of my adoration, and gently insinuated a finger within its moist lips. The touch of my finger, however, within such a sensitive spot, seemed to rouse her at once, for she started up, saying, Not now, Frank, not now, dearest. You must let me go. I must have time to think over this. I know you won't refuse me when I tell you I cannot remain with you at present. There, that is a good boy. Go back to the drawing room, and I shall follow you immediately. At the same time, she gave a fond pressure on the sensitive plant she still held in her grasp, imprinted a warm kiss on my lips, and then tore herself from my arms. I felt that the place was not such as to enable me to attempt to carry the matter farther at present, and delaying for a minute or two in the conservatory that I might calm down my excitement a little, I slipped quietly back to the drawing room to cover the agitation I still felt. I again joined in the waltz with the first partner I could find. In a few minutes Laura returned to the room, nor could anyone have possibly discovered from her manner that she had so recently undergone such violent emotion. I could hardly believe it possible that the seemingly proud and haughty girl was the same panting, trembling creature who had so recently been in my arms. I soon, however, found reason to regret I had not chosen a more fitting reason for my denouement in which case I might perhaps have turned it to greater profit than I appeared likely to do. With the morning, she recovered all her coolness and self-possession, and had evidently determined on the course she was to pursue. She did not leave her room till breakfast time, and afterwards evaded all my stratagems to obtain a private interview with her. After luncheon the horses were brought to the door, 
and a large party started out for a ride. When we had gone a short distance, she contrived to let the others get ahead of us so as to leave us alone together, for I had got her to dispense with Master John's attendance when I accompanied her. She then turned up a quiet lane which led to a common, where there was little chance of our meeting anyone, and where the many bushes, scattered in large clumps over it, were high enough to conceal us from observation. Then, without any hesitation, she entered at once on the subject which engrossed all my thoughts. She said she could not imagine how I could possibly have discovered her secret, but that as it was clear I had done so, it was no use for her now to attempt to deny it, and that she was quite sure I would not make any use of it that could be injurious to her. But don't suppose, said she, that I am offended at the manner you took of showing me you had found out my propensity. It was a very good idea, and I shall be delighted to become better acquainted with my new friend, at the same time placing her hand upon him. He's a very handsome little fellow. But I must tell you frankly, that though I shall be happy to contribute as far as I safely can to afford him amusement, you must not expect that I can allow him to do what might get me into most serious difficulties. Perhaps after a time even this may be managed, but at present it is out of the question, so he must be contented for the present with the pleasures I can safely afford him. As she spoke, she continued to unbutton my trousers and remove my shirt, until she had fairly uncovered her new acquaintance, which started out under the pressure of her soft fingers, showing his head, proudly, erect. She loaded it with caresses, at the same time expressing in the warmest terms her admiration of its size and beauty. I saw at once from her manner that she had made her mind up on the subject, and that there was no chance of complete success on that occasion, at least. So I resolved to make the best of the opportunity and humor her inclination, and do all in my power to gratify her in her own way, trusting that on some more propitious occasion I might obtain my wishes in their fullest extent. Ascertaining, therefore, that there was no one in sight, and that we were in such a position as to be able to command a view all round of some considerable distance, so that no one could keep approach us without being observed. I said that all I desired was to contribute to her happiness, and that I only wanted to know in what manner that could be best done, and that I was quite ready to use every exertion in my power to effect it, that if she had any curiosity about her new acquaintance, I was quite prepared to do anything I could to gratify her. She said she was curious about it, and would be delighted to have a better view of it, and see what it could do. I immediately unbuttoned my braces and let down my trousers, and tucked up my shirt under my waistcoat. Then, bringing my leg over the horse so as to sit on one side in her own fashion, exposed everything to her view. She seemed perfectly enchanted as she took hold of and played with the ivory column, and uncovered its ruby head and explored the secrets of the pendant receptacles of the liquid of life. She seemed to be fully aware of the effect of her soft hand moving up and down upon the object of her worship, and she watched with eagerness the consequences her operation produced. I did not attempt to conceal my emotions from her in the least, and gave myself up to the voluptuous sensations which her proceedings could not fail to occasion, till they attained such a height that a full overflow of the precious liquid, spouting from the overexcited tube, fairly attested the effect produced upon me. She gazed upon the charming sight with evident delight, and dwelt upon every excited motion I made, endeavoring by every means in her power to heighten and increase my enjoyment. When I had in some measure recovered from the pleasure trance, I threw my arms around her and thanked her for all the pleasure she had afforded me, and awoke. said it was not fair that I should enjoy all the delight and I trusted she would allow me to repeat upon her the lesson she had thus practiced on me. She said at once that she would not get off the horse, but that if it would afford me any pleasure she was quite willing that I should do anything I liked with her in that position. I saw it was no use to attempt more, so I resolved to make the most of my situation. Dismounting from my horse, I removed her leg from the horn of the saddle, and raising up her clothes discovered her most exquisite thighs, and the enchanting object between them almost completely hidden under a cluster of dark auburn curly hair. After kissing and caressing it for some minutes, parting the moist lips, 
and tickling the surrounding moss. I tried to introduce my finger. The tightness of the aperture and the difficulty I had in getting it in beyond an inch or two soon satisfied me that either the pain or the fear of all doing mischief had prevented her from using the substitute to such an extent as to deprive the first living entrant of the glory and pleasure of four. A victory over her virgin charms, and this discovery increased tenfold the desire I felt to be the conqueror in such a splendid field of battle. I did the best I could in the situation in which I was placed, and partly with my finger, and partly with my tongue, I succeeded in creating such a degree of titillation upon her sensitive cl and the adjacent parts that, sided as it was by the excitement of the scene that had previously been enacted, it produced such an effect upon her as she had never previously experienced. When her convulsive motion ceased, and the stream flowed over my fingers down her thighs, she bent down her head and fondly kissed me, acknowledging that I had contrived to afford her more pleasure than she had believed it possible she could enjoy. I seized the opportunity to point out to her the effect which her wanton hand had upon my champion, for she had now bent down to grasp it and play with it again, and it still held up its proud head as erect as ever. I endeavored to persuade her that what she had experienced was nothing in comparison with the bliss he could bestow upon her. But she remained firm, and would not allow me to give her a practical illustration of my theory, though she was so delighted with her little friend that she continued to caress and fondle him whenever she could, almost all the way till we reached home. Two or three scenes of this nature followed in the course of the few following days, and still I could not contrive to get further with her. I therefore resolved to try the effect of a stratagem that had occurred to me. Though she had resisted all my entreaties to meet me at the summer house, I had told her the day after our explanation that I would not act so cruelly to her as she did to me and that I was desirous to contribute to her amusement in any manner she liked best. And, therefore, as she seemed determined that her visits to the summer house should be solitary ones, I would put some books and pictures in the hiding place which I was sure would divert her, and add to her enjoyment whenever she would take a fancy to repair thither. I kept a watch upon her, but never could catch her there, though I soon became aware from the change in decay position of the books that she occasionally visited the place when she knew I was away and could not surprise her. I selected a day on which a party was made up to visit some objects of curiosity in the neighborhood. And when she had announced her intention to stay at home, having already been often at the place, and to allow another lady of the party to ride her horse. In the morning I arranged with my groom that he should file off the heads of the nails of one of my horse's shoes so that the shoe should come off easily, and I appointed him to meet me a short distance from the house on the road we were to take. After I had proceeded with the party for a few miles, I pretended to think that my horse was going lame, and dismounting, I exhibited one foot with the shoe nearly off. As the horse was a valuable one, the excuse was readily accepted that I could not proceed farther, but must walk him back quietly. As soon, however, as the party had got out of sight, by the aid of a hammer and a few nails I had taken in my pocket, I fastened the shoe and started back at full speed. Meeting my groom at the place I had appointed, I told him to get the horse properly shod and then take him to a small inn and retired place a few miles off, so as not to have my return known at the hall. I then hastened to make my way across the fields to the summer house, having a strong hope that Laura would take advantage of the opportunity for visiting it as my absence would render it safe for her to do so, and would at the same time preclude the chance of her being able to have any gratification in my company, and reduce her to her solitary amusement. On making a more minute inspection of the summer house, I had discovered a circumstance which was not apparent at first sight, and which had inspired me with the idea of my present operation. The ceiling was formed of small branches, split and nailed together in the form of panels, one of these, I discovered, was movable, and gave access to a small apartment above, part of which was floored over, and occasionally used by the gardener to dry seeds. To this apartment, the only access was by means of a ladder. The ceiling, however, was low enough to admit of my catching hold of the sides of the opening when standing on a stool, 
and thus swinging myself up into the interior. I had contrived, by means of oiling the hinges well and attaching a weight with a pulley, to make the entrance open easily, and without the least noise, and I had also made some small apertures in the roof from which I could keep a lookout. I immediately took possession of my hiding place and closed the entrance, resolved to take the chance of Laura's coming, if I had to wait there the whole day, for I knew the precaution I had taken would prevent anything being known of my being in the neighborhood until the return of the party, who had made the necessary arrangements for taking refreshments with them, and were not to be back till the evening. I waited with patience all the forenoon, comforted with the idea that in all probability Laura would find herself at leisure after luncheon, at which time some of the elder part of the company, who had not joined the expedition, usually drove out. It happened as I had anticipated, and very soon after the ordinary luncheon hour I was rejoiced to see Laura approaching. I was very certain from the manner in which she looked about her as she drew near what her object was and I made my arrangements before she arrived so as to be able to keep perfectly still till the proper time came. After taking a walk round the place apparently to make certain that no one was in the neighborhood, she came in and taking out one of the books, sat down to peruse it. Convinced that my only chance of success was to catch her in the critical moment when she would be too much overwhelmed by her voluptuous sensations to offer any resistance, and afraid that any resistance precipitate movement on my part might enable her to retain that self-command of which she possessed so large a share. I waited quietly for the effect of the seductive entertainment I had provided for her, nor was it long before it began to produce the expected result. Her color heightened. She moved backwards and forwards upon the couch apparently unconsciously, and at last her fingers stole under her petticoats, and reached the part which was the principal scene of her excitement, and which I could see from the motions of her arm she was attempting to allay. In a few minutes she appeared to be unable longer to withstand the temptation which the opportunity offered, and rising up, she went to the hiding place, and took from it some lascivious pictures and the little object with which she intended to solace herself. After heightening her desires by an attentive examination of the seductive plates, she raised her dress and stretched herself on the couch much in the same attitude in which I had previously seen her. And after a little toying with her finger, she separated the ruby lips and introduced the mock representation of that part of me which I was so eager to enable her to judge how much more pleasure the reality would afford her. Even then I had the patience to wait until she had made use of it for some little time, and until I could discern from sundry sighs that the pleasure it was giving her was approaching a climax. Then gently raising the trap door and catching hold of the sides, I quietly let myself drop into the apartment below. A slight rustling noise I made attracted her attention, and looking up from her book, she beheld my almost naked body with the most prominent object of it standing fiercely erect, for I had let down my trousers and turned up my shirt so as to afford her a complete view of my person. At this sight, so suddenly and unexpectedly presented to her, without her at first being able to discover who it was that thus presented himself in such a guise. She was so struck with surprise and astonishment that she was in the utmost consternation and completely lost her presence of mind, remaining motionless even after I had fully appeared before her and approached her so that she must have recognized me. Aware that if I was to profit by the opportunity, I must not lose a moment in explanation, I at once got between her thighs, which were stretched out widely extended, and withdrawing the wretched mock article from its darling retreat, I threw myself upon her, and instantly, without the least hesitation, replaced it with the reality. I was quite aware I should find some difficulty in getting admission, but most fortunately her situation was so extremely favorable that I was enabled so far to affect my knee object as to get the head of my weapon fairly inserted within the delicious lips of her charmer before she had recovered from her surprise sufficiently to offer any opposition. Then, indeed, she attempted to rise up, exclaiming, Oh, Frank, Frank, this will never do. By this time, however, I had got my arms fairly round her waist and held her locked in a close embrace. 
And while I endeavored to stifle her remonstrances with burning kisses on her fair lips, I exerted my utmost efforts to improve my position. My thrusts and heaves, driven with the greatest vigor my burning passion could inspire me with, evidently hurt her severely. But this I had expected and was fully prepared for. As I was aware from my previous inspections of the charming spot, that it never had been stretched to such an extent as to enable me to attain free admission, and consequently I was not disposed to relax in my efforts on that account, trusting that the overwhelming pleasure that would ensue would fully make up for all suffering, and that I should obtain full possession as soon as she should be enabled to join in my transports. Her very struggles, caused partly by pain and partly by apprehension, as she endeavored to rise up, only aided me in effecting my purpose. And after a short contest, I had the satisfaction and delight of feeling the resistance which her virgin obstacles had offered to my progress entirely give way, and my victorious champion had penetrated her inmost secret recesses in such an effectual manner as to produce the most delicious conjunction of the most sensitive parts of our bodies that can possibly be conceived. The effect upon her, however, was not so immediately delightful as it was upon me. The pain occasioned by the last few thrusts by which I had completed the achievement had been so severe as to make her abandon her resistance. And when it suddenly ceased, on my weapon obtaining complete entrance, she sank back on the couch as if exhausted. I followed her example and sank down upon her, pressing her more closely in my arms and being now relieved from the necessity of using force. I regulated the movements of my victorious champion so as to try to avoid as far as possible giving her any further pain and endeavor to replace it with more delightful sensations. But with the removal of the pain her apprehensions revived, and she again entreated me to let her rise. Her request, however, now came too late Tevin had I been disposed to comply with it, which I certainly was not, the excited state into which she had worked herself. Previous to my appearing on the scene had produced such an effect upon her frame that very few up and down movements of my pleasure a jiver within the now thoroughly opened up premises were quite sufficient to remove all traces of the pain and to produce the consummation he was laboring to effect and was so eager to join in. Before she had time to repeat her request, and even before I was quite prepared to respond to the tide of joy, her head again sank back and she exclaimed, Oh! Um, delicious, oh, dearest, oh, I can bear it no longer. Her ecstatic movements, while in the act of enjoyment, were all that was required to make me join in her delight. And pouring forth a torrent of bliss, I sank motionless on her breast, enjoying a happiness that may be conceived, but cannot possibly be described. When I had recovered a little from my transports, still retaining my place, I thought it was time to endeavor to appease her indignation which I feared might have been aroused at the trap I had evidently laid for her. But I soon found I had no occasion to be alarmed on this subject. She had no hesitation in admitting that, though she had so long resisted my entrance, it had only been from the fear of the consequences, and she had all alone been as anxious as I was for the crowning pleasure from the first moment when she had viewed the potent charms of my pleasure giver and she had been as much disappointed and annoyed at the unsatisfactory manner in which our intercourse had hitherto been conducted, and she even went on to say that, whatever the consequences might be to her, she was rejoiced I had had the courage to make her break through the restraint she had imposed on herself. Accordingly, when I asked her whether her new acquaintance had not justified, by the result he had produced, all that I had predicted as, D consequences of his being admitted into his present delicious quarter, she frankly confessed that though she at first had suffered dreadfully from the tearing open of her interior, the final close had much more than gratified all her expectation and had fully made up for all she had endured, and she added that she never would have forgiven me if I had yielded to her entreaties and left the performance unfinished. But now, said she, that this little darling has done his duty so well. Do get up and take a look about, in case anyone should stray in this direction. I don't want to part with you so soon, 
but it would never do for anyone to come in and catch us in this situation. No, no, dearest, I replied. You only half enjoyed yourself the last time, and I am afraid if I were to withdraw this little gentleman I might have to give. You more pain in replacing him, and as I want you thoroughly to enter into all the blissful sensations of this occasion, you must let him remain where he is. What? said she. Do you mean to say he can do it again? Oh, that would be delicious. But I'm so frightened for anyone coming. Well, dearest, just keep your arms round me, and I shall raise you up till we can take a look about us. And clasping her round the waist so as to keep us still firmly united by the pleasantest of all links, I raised her up to a position from which we could command a view all round us, and thus satisfy ourselves that all was safe. Then gently laying her down, I again commenced operations at first, thrusting my weapon cautiously and gradually in and out of the charming orifice so as to avoid the risk of hurting her. But I soon found there was no danger of this. The elements of pleasure were so fiercely aroused within her that my exertions occasioned very different sensations from those which had accompanied my mind. First entrance into her delicious quarters, and in a few minutes her efforts to promote our mutual bliss vied with, if they did not exceed, my own. For the first time in her life, she thoroughly enjoyed the most exquisite of all sensations a woman can be blessed with, that of having her most sensitive region. Fully gorged with the masterpiece which first works her up to the most amorous frenzy, and then subdues her by making her die away with itself in melting bliss. There was not a moment from the time when I half withdrew and again inserted the delicious morsel, the possession of which she so much enjoyed, till the overwhelming bliss of mutual emission took away our senses, that she did not evince both by her gestures and her words the most excessive and frantic delight and I need hardly say that my enjoyment equaled hers. When our second course was finished, I withdrew my still unexhausted weapon, which notwithstanding its double victory still held up its head bravely. But I was somewhat horrified at the mingled tide which now poured out its crimson stream down her thighs. She was in great distress lest it might betray her, but I managed to prevent any of it getting upon her dress and persuaded her to accompany me to a small fountain a little way off where, dipping my handkerchief in the water, I first removed all marks of the conflict, and then continued to bathe the swollen and tender lips, which still bore traces of the fierce nature of the combat. Finding the cooling sensation was grateful to her, I continued the application until the sight of her charms, thus freely exposed, made the author of the mischief so wild a tea. The contemplation of the effects of his own deeds that I was obliged to show the state he was in, and tell her that it would require another defeat before he could be quieted. She hesitated a little from the fear of the pain accompanying his re-entrance in the present tender state of her interior, but seeing that he also bore bloody marks of the fray, she insisted on reciprocating the good offices I had bestowed upon her, and taking the handkerchief, she proceeded to remove them by tenderly bathing the little gentleman. Pretty well aware what would be the consequence of this proceeding, I allowed her to take her own way. And as even the application of the cold water failed to quench his ardor, she at length admitted that there was nothing for it but to renew the combat, and we accordingly returned to the summer house. Notwithstanding all my care, the pain I occasioned her while getting fairly established within her was very severe, but she persevered. In her efforts to introduce him to his old quarters, until she had effectually accomplished it to our mutual satisfaction. As soon as I had fairly reached the bottom, I desisted from the attack, and allowed her to remain quiet till all. Her suffering had entirely subsided, and she was again in a condition to be able to enjoy the perfect pleasure. The first hot eagerness of novelty being now over, we both felt disposed on this occasion, to prolong our enjoyment as much as possible, and we accordingly proceeded with the operation more leisurely, watching the effects to our mutual efforts to produce the greatest enjoyment, and telling each other when to quicken, or retard our movements, so as to keep the delicious sensations at their highest pitch, and at the same time delay the final crisis as long as possible.
Sometimes it was I who would urge the fierce intruder backwards and forwards in his career of pleasure, and sometimes making me remain still. It was she who, with up and down heaves of her delicious buttocks, would make the lips and sides of her charming, tight-fitting sheath move over my entranced weapon, creating within it the most voluptuous sensations it is possible to conceive. But at length, we could restrain ourselves no longer, and then again commenced a furious struggle of mutual heaves and thrusts, intermingled with burning kisses and fond caresses, which soon resulted in drawing from us a pleasing stream of such enchanting ecstasy that Laura declared it was even more delicious than the previous one, which she had believed could not have been surpassed. By this time she began to be afraid that her absence might be noticed, and insisted that it was time for her to return to the hall. Before she left me, I easily persuaded her to resume her morning visits to the summer house, and to allow me to meet her there. I satisfied her that there was no risk in this, as in the event of anyone coming to the place by chance. I could easily take refuge in my hiding place, so that no suspicion could arise if she were found there alone. For several mornings we continued to indulge ourselves with a repetition of our amorous pranks and every meeting only added to the zest with which we gave ourselves up to every mode of enjoyment we could devise. The sole drawback to our pleasures was the impossibility in such an exposed situation of enjoying the sight and the touch attity. Once of the whole of each other's charms, and I anxiously watched for any opportunity when we might be able to accomplish this, one forenoon Lady Middleton had accompanied the rest of the party on a visit to some friends in the neighborhood, from which they were not to return till night, leaving at home only Sir Hugh, Miss Middleton, Laura, and myself. I had made some excuse for not accompanying the party, but my real reason was the wish to have an opportunity of meeting Laura, as she had been unable to keep her appointment with me that morning. Though I little expected that I was to be thereby enabled to arrange for the full accomplishment of our most anxious wishes. I was sitting with the two ladies when a servant brought in a note for Miss Middleton, saying that the messenger waited for an answer. She read it and said to Laura, This is very provoking. It is a note from Mr. Percival asking me to come over and meet the Seville's at dinner. I should like so much to go, as all our party are away today and I shall not have another opportunity of meeting my old friends. But I am afraid there is no conveyance to take me. If the pony were able to go, I should drive over in the pony case. But I fear he is not sufficiently recovered from his accident. Laura's eyes and mine met, and all the advantage of getting her aunt away for the night flashed upon us. I gave her a look to urge her aunt to go. She reflected for a minute, and then said she did not think the pony was fit for work yet, but that her aunt might send for a carriage from the town, which was some miles distant, and that she would arrange with her mother to come for her the next morning. To this, however, Miss Middleton objected, saying that before a messenger could go on foot and bring the carriage it would be too late, even if he succeeded in getting it, which was doubtful. I now thought I might venture to interfere, and addressing Miss Middleton, I said, I did not think you would have treated me with so much ceremony. You know there are two horses of mine standing idle in the stable, which are quite at your service if you wish to send a messenger into town. My servant shall go directly, but I think the best plan will be for you to allow me to drive you over in my dog cart. And as you may not like coming home in the dark, I shall come back for you tomorrow at any hour you may fix. She appeared to hesitate, but Laura had little difficulty in persuading her to accept my offer. She accordingly went to prepare while I ordered the dog cart to be got ready. Before setting out, I arranged with Laura that as it might appear strange were, I to insist on returning to dinner when she was alone at home with her father. I should, if invited, remain at the Percival's till evening. She agreed to go to bed at her usual hour and to leave the door connecting her room and mine unlocked and to tie a white ribbon to the door handle if all was safe for me to come to her. I started with Miss Middleton, and as I had expected, was urged to remain till next day. I at once agreed to stay for dinner, but refused all their pressing to remain all night, on the plea that I had made no preparations for so doing. I remained till pretty late, and then started for the hall, promising to return the next forenoon for Miss Middleton.
By the time I arrived, everyone had gone to bed, and I hastened to follow their example. My first impulse was to examine Laura's door, and I was rejoiced to find the agreed -in signal. I hastily stripped off my clothes, and opening the door softly, found her still awake, awaiting my arrival. Throwing down the bedclothes, I was about to jump into her arms, when it occurred to me that the operations we were contemplated might perhaps leave some traces behind, which might lead to suspicion if discovered in her bed. I therefore said to her that it would be safer for her to repair with me to mine. Ascertaining that her door was locked so as to prevent all intrusion, I took her round the waist and led her to my room. As soon as we reached the bedside, I threw off my shirt and said, Now, dearest, since we have at last obtained the long-desired opportunity, we must endeavor to avail ourselves of it to the best of our abilities. I shall try to contribute as much as I can to your happiness, and I am sure you will not hesitate to do anything in your power to add to mine. Now, the first thing to be done is to get rid of all these obstacles to my fully seeing and enjoying all your charms. She made no objection to my removing the envious veil which covered her person. Indeed, I think she was quite as anxious as I was to enjoy the delight which the contemplation of each other's beauties was sure to produce upon us. However, at last we were both too eager to enjoy the e summum bonum of earthly felicity to give up much time to the preliminaries. After a cursory inspection of each other's persons, I stretched her at full length upon the bed, and getting upon her I made her herself insert my stiffly distended champion in two, her delicious pleasure sheath, and enabled her, for the first time, to enjoy the delicious sensation occasioned by the complete contact in every quarter of our naked bodies, making her clasp her arms around me and twist her thighs and legs about my hips. I drove my rammer into her as far as it would go, and then commenced a more voluptuous encounter than any we had yet sustained. Fired by the sight she had enjoyed of my naked person, and animated by the delicious sensations which our close contact was sure to occasion, she responded at once to all my movements and out. There ensued a fierce combat between us, each of us striving by every artifice and exertion in our power to prove the victor, and while conquering, to add to the enjoyment of the vanquished. She proved the conqueror by forcing me to be the first to yield up my tribute, but not wishing to be outdone in the capacity of conferring pleasure. I continued my vigorous heaves and thrusts in the delicious receptacle in which I was engulfed, while I felt the warm life drops bursting from me in a torrent of bliss, until I was sensible that she also had yielded to the potent spell and shared my enjoyment by mingling her contribution with the tide which flowed from me. Then, with a warm kiss, we ceased our efforts, and lay for a while locked in each other's arms, still joined together by the tender tie that bound us in a perfect heaven of luxurious delight. If we could have reckoned upon a similar enjoyment every night, we would both have remained thus closely embracing for the whole night without desiring greater pleasure but the slight view of her splendid charms I had already enjoyed had only heightened my desire for a more minute inspection of them, and I could not afford to lose the opportunity thus fortunately presented to me. Getting up, therefore, and lighting some additional candles I had prepared for the purpose, I stretched her out all naked as she was on the bed, and commenced a thorough examination of all those beauties which I had so eagerly longed to inspect— and which as yet I had only been able partially and cursorily to investigate. No part of her escaped my ardent gaze and eager touch. She willingly yielded to my wishes. Nay, she even seemed gratified by my eagerness, and placed herself in every position in which she fancied I should be able to detect a new beauty. Every portion of her body, both before and behind, was in succession the object of my adoration, and was covered with the most passionate and thrilling kisses and caresses. The effect of this may easily be imagined, and it was not long before the imposing majesty of my overjoyed pleasure giver showed to her, and equally convinced me of the necessity we were under of cooling our ardor by a repetition of the same delightful process which we had already undergone. After this was happily concluded, 
she insisted on having in her turn the same privilege I had enjoyed. And she made me undergo the same minute investigation to which she had been subjected. Her curiosity was excessive, every object underwent the most searching examination. And of course, all those hearts in which there was a difference between us were more particularly and vigorously explored and discussed. It was impossible for me to remain insensible to her lascivious caresses, which again roused the fire within me. My staff of love started up proud and erect as if eager to exhibit its full proportions to her ardent gaze. Upon me the effect was most delicious. To find myself lying there stark naked before a lovely girl, and undergoing the delightful touches with which she covered every part of my person as she explored my most secret charms, and at the same time to gaze on all her splendid beauties, which were as freely exposed before me, was bliss indeed, which roused me to the highest pitch of excitement. And again, I repaid her in the most delicious manner for all the pleasing sensations her charming researches had excited in me. After this we lay for some time in each other's arms luxuriating in the blissful feelings caused by our complete conjunction. Till morning beginning to appear, I suggested that she should endeavor to obtain a little repose to prevent the fatigues of the night, exhibiting their traces upon her too obviously the next day. Not yet satisfied, however, she laid her hand on the weapon of love, as if to ascertain whether it was yet capable of again conferring upon her the bliss she desired. Quite understanding and appreciating her object, I soon satisfied her in the most practical manner that his powers were by no means wholly exhausted. And having achieved another victory over our raging desires, we at length fell asleep locked in each other's arms. When I awoke, the sun was shining brightly into the room. During her sleep, Laura had somewhat changed her position, and instead of fronting me, had turned upon her left side, presenting her splendid posteriors to me, between which my champion was nestling himself. Judging by his imposing appearance, his powers did not seem any way impaired by the exertions of the previous night. Turning down the bedclothes, I for some time quietly reveled in the sight of her charms, and then getting excited beyond endurance. Though unwilling to disturb her peaceful slumber, I thought I might perhaps be able, without awakening her, to take up a more satisfactory position than the one I enjoyed. So gently raising her right leg and creeping as close behind her as I could, I placed my right leg between her thighs in such a manner that my nigh champion shoved himself between her legs, stretching up almost to her navel. In this position I lay for some little time till somehow muttered words, and certain movements of her body made me suspect that Laura and her sleep was acting over again the scenes of the previous night, convinced that she would have no more objection than myself to the illusion being converted into the reality. I gently separated the lips of the seat of pleasure and inserted the tip of the appropriate organ. His sweet touch in such a sensitive spot at once broke her slumber. She opened her eyes and glancing downward got a full view of my stiffly distended weapon with its ruby head quite uncovered just entering within the charming precincts of her lovely retreat, and she said smiling that it was just what she had been dreaming of. She was then going to turn herself round towards me, but I told her to remain as she was, and that I thought we should be able to accomplish our wishes in that position. I pointed out to her that although we could not so well enjoy the pleasure of kissing each other, we could at least better watch and observe each other's operations while my weapon was perforating her. As the reflection of our figures in a large mirror, which I had purposely placed so as to produce the best effect, would add greatly to our enjoyment. Looking towards it, she blushed deeply at beholding exposed to her full view, her own lovely face, exquisite swelling breasts, snow-white belly and ivory thighs, with the upper part of the mount of the mount. Pleasure beautifully shaded with its appropriate fringe, and the lips swollen and distended with the shaft of love, while my leg, holding her thighs apart, exposed to view between them the pleasure yielding receptacles of its liquid treasures, and at every heave I gave exhibited, at full length, the staff of my weapon, as I alternately penetrated and then partly withdrew it from its delicious sheath. 
This exquisite sight delighted us so much that we determined to prolong it as much as possible, and regulating each other's movements so as to keep up the enjoyment to the uttermost and at the same time hold back the crisis, we lay in the most ecstatic bliss for upwards of an hour, enjoying the thrilling delight which this perfect combination of the most exquisite sensations of touch and sight can confer. At length, in spite of our endeavors, we could no longer restrain the tide of passion. A few furious heaves of my maddened and thrusting pleasure-a-giver completed our bliss, and the genial shower sprinkled the field of pleasure and calmed our overexcited senses. One other soul-stirring enjoyment was all we had time to accomplish before the approach of the hour, at which Laura was usually called, warned us that we must separate and with the most poignant regret that we might not have another opportunity of again enjoying ourselves in such a delightful manner, we parted. In the forenoon I drove out for Miss Middleton. As her friends wished her to remain, I of course endeavored to persuade her to do so, and offered to come back for her on any day she might fix, but she insisted on returning home that day. I had, however, the satisfaction of finding that she had made an arrangement with the friends whom she had gone to meet to pay them a visit for some weeks as soon as they returned to their own abode, which they were to do in about a week. One circumstance, however, occurred the same day which rather counterbalanced the pleasure with which I received this intelligence. Young Master Frank on leaving school had gone to pay a visit to a schoolfellow, but a letter had arrived from him that morning to say that he would be home the next day. Now his arrival and consequent occupation of the room between Loris and mine threatened to prevent the constant agreeable intercourse which I expected to be able to keep up with her during her aunt's absence. I felt very much annoyed at the idea, and urged her, if possible, to get some arrangement made by which she might occupy some other apartment. She said, however, that she was afraid to make any such proposal to her mother, for fear of exciting suspicions as to her object, or of occasioning my removal to another room, which would be equally destructive for our projects. On the whole, she took the matter so quietly and coolly that I was rather astonished, considering the enjoyment she evidently had in our intercourse. A little annoyed at this, I made up my mind that if my young friend retained any portion of the youthful beauty I remembered him to possess, I would endeavor, if possible, to make up in his arms for the enjoyment he would deprive me of by keeping me out of his sister's. His first appearance had once decided me to follow out the idea that had occurred to me, some years younger than his sister and just of that delightful age when the passions of manhood have begun to exert their influence on the senses. But before they have taken away the attractive and charming bloom and graces of youth, he was, if possible, more captivating than his sister. Indeed, when upon one occasion I dressed him up as a girl, it was almost impossible to distinguish between them and he might easily have passed for her, even among her intimate acquaintances. We became good friends at once. When the ladies left the table after dinner, I made a sign to him to come over beside me, and he was very soon communicating to me all his secrets. I easily led him to talk of his schoolfellows and their amusements, and when the party rose to join the ladies, he was in the midst of the details of the history of one of the elder boys to whom a married lady had taken a fancy at a house where he had been visiting, and who had conferred a favor on him of which it was very evident my young friend was somewhat envious. When we went to the drawing-room, he wanted to continue the history. But I said to him that it would be better not to do so. There, but as he slept in the next room to mine, he might come to me after we had retired for the night, when we would have a better opportunity for discussing the subject. He said he would, but that I was not to expect him till everyone had gone to bed, in case his mother or sister should come into his room. Although a little surprised at this allusion to the latter, I was quite satisfied from what he said that all was right, as, unless he somewhat comprehended my object, he would not have thought it necessary to make any mystery or take any precaution on the subject. I went to bed and taking a book, remained awake reading until I heard my door open, and my young friend entered with only his nightshirt on. When he came to the bedside, I at once threw down the bedclothes and made room for him beside me. He jumped in instantly, 
and clasping him in my arms I pressed him to my bosom. He warmly returned my embrace, and the idea I had formed as to his appreciating my intentions was immediately confirmed by my finding. Something hard and stiff pressing against my belly, and I soon managed to ascertain that his instrument was in a state of fierce erection. After a few kisses and caresses, I led to the subject of his young friend and the lady, asking how old he was, and then lay my hand upon his organ of pleasure, asked him whether his friend's plaything was bigger than this. He said at once it was, and then taking hold of mine, which as may be supposed was standing stiff enough, he added that it was not so big as mine. Continuing to caress his little charmer, I said I was afraid it was a very naughty little gentleman, and asked whether he had ever had a lady to teach him how to behave himself properly. He said, Oh, no, I have not been so fortunate, but I do wish I could get someone to do it with me. I can think of nothing else night or day, and I shall go wild, and thus I can manage it before long. The manner in which my caresses affected him showed plainly how excitable he was. He pressed me to him, and as I grasped his instrument, he twisted himself backwards and forwards, endeavoring to make my hand serve as a substitute for what he so eagerly desired, while he begged of me to tell him whether I could not put him in the way of obtaining the fulfillment of his wishes. I at once promised that if he would get permission to pay me a visit at the hall, I would arrange that he should have as much of it as he liked, if he would only allow me to witness and participate with him in his pleasures. In his delight and gratitude, he at once said that he would do anything I liked, that I had only to tell what I wanted, and he would be as eager as I could be to do whatever was in his power that would contribute to my enjoyment. During this conversation I had been playing with his pretty little instrument as he had been with mine, and I had occasionally introduced it between my thighs, squeezing them together so as to compress it between them, and meeting, and returning the thrusts, which he could not help giving on finding his little charmer so agreeably tickled by my soft flesh. This drew from him exclamations of delight. Why, my dear boy, said I, if this gives you pleasure, as I imagine it does, I think I could manage to make you do it in a manner that will be more agreeable still. Turning round to him, I presented to him my posteriors, and retaining hold of his instrument, I inserted it between my hips, and squeezing and pressing it in the same manner as formerly, I enabled him to enjoy the pleasing friction over a larger portion of the surface of his now inflamed weapon. This seemed to gratify him extremely, and he repeatedly thanked me for the nice way in which he said I made him do it, and protested that he had never enjoyed it so much before. I told him I thought I could make it even pleasanter still. I had still retained my fingers round the root of his sensitive plant, and I now drew it back a little, and raising the point, directed it to the orifice between the cheeks of my posteriors. Opening the lips so as to permit the head to penetrate a short way, I made the cheeks of my bottom close round the head of the intruder so as to produce a most delicious compression upon it, which drew from him the exclamation, Oh! This is splendid. I then asked him whether he had ever put it in here before. He seemed a little surprised at the question and said no. And then putting down his hand and ascertaining, the little charmer's head was actually within the lips of the orifice. He immediately asked, will it go in? Just try, my dear boy, was my answer. He did not wait for any pressing, but immediately pressed forwards. And as I favored the insertion as much as I could, a very few thrusts sufficed to lodge the charming intruder fairly within me, evidently as much to his delight as it was to mine. As soon as it was driven completely home, and his thighs and belly came in close contact with my buttocks, he ceased his movements and lay still for some minutes, apparently in the greatest ecstasy. The complete constriction which was thus established on every part of his stiff standing, instrument so tightly fitting and pressing upon it, and yet so deliciously tender, and yet soft was so different from anything he had ever previously felt, when his own or a schoolfellow's hand had procured for him an emission, it seemed quite to overpower him. After fully enjoying himself for a little time, he withdrew the inflamed morsel, which I felt burning hot within me, 
bringing it out nearly to its full extent, and then replacing it. He then said, Tell me, my dear fellow, may I do this? It is so delicious, but I'm afraid of hurting you. Hurting me? I replied. You need not be very afraid of that. Does that feel as if you are hurting me? Taking his hand and placing it upon my inflamed member, of which in his excitement he had lost his hold, and which throbbing and burning stood up fiercely erected along my belly, excited to the utmost by the charming pressure which his member exerted upon its sensitive root. No, no, the little charmer is not quite big enough yet to do any harm. He is just the size to give me as much pleasure as he will give you. So don't be afraid to do anything you like, and I shall do my best to help you. Encouraged by this, he commenced operations which I seconded with all my might. At first he pushed backwards and forwards, gently and regularly, and I had no difficulty in keeping time with him. But after a little, he became so excited and thrust, followed thrust with such velocity and so irregularly, that I found it quite impossible to keep in unison with him, and could only aid his frantic efforts by the compression of the muscles upon his raging champion, which I exerted whenever he gave me an opportunity by making a more prolonged thrust than usual within me. In the meantime, his panting sobs and sighs bore testimony to the excess of his enjoyment and the near approach of the voluptuous crisis, which was speedily announced by an exclamation. Oh, goodness! Oh! I felt my delightful invader pressed into me with all his force, as if he wished his whole body could follow. I endeavored to add to his delight by a few movements on my part, for he was now so overcome with pleasure as to be almost incapable of motion, and contracting the mouth of the orifice as much as I could, I pressed upon his swollen and throbbing column and strove to prolong his pleasure by delaying as long as possible the passage of the precious liquid through it, which was now bursting from him in furious jets. I succeeded in this so well that he has often told me, since that in all the amorous encounters he has subsequently been engaged in, and they are not a few, he has never enjoyed such delicious sensations as he did on this occasion when he first felt the ravishing delight of his pleasure-giving member being completely engulfed within and compressed by the magical circle of living flesh. After he had lain quiet for a little while, I felt his somewhat attenuated weapon slip out of me. He then turned himself round, presenting his buttocks to me, and still keeping his hold on my member, which he had maintained during all his raptures. He gently drew me round also, nothing unwilling, and presenting his captive at the entrance to its destined prison, he opened the lips of his orifice as much as he could, and tried to get him in. I was amused and delighted with his eagerness about it, but fearful of hurting him, I did not attempt to force my way in, until he asked me why I did not assist him in getting it farther in. I said simply because I was afraid that, as he had not tried it before, I might hurt him the first time, but that if he would allow me to try, I would endeavor to do it with as little suffering to him as possible. He had once told me to do anything I liked, that he could not expect me to allow him to enjoy himself within me again, unless he reciprocated the pleasure, and that he would willingly suffer any amount of pain to be permitted again to taste the delight he had already felt. I was in no way averse to take him at his word, and accordingly set to work. As he gave me every facility, I was enabled with the aid of a little cold cream to make my way in with less difficulty than I expected. My first penetration no doubt hurt him a little, but he bore it manfully and urged me to proceed till, to my infinite delight, I was fairly lodged within him up to the hill. The avenue was as tight and delightful as possible, but it was of that charming elasticity which yielded sufficiently to admit the invader, and at the same time pressed upon him with that degree of force which occasioned the most consummate voluptuous gratifications. As soon as I was fairly in, all annoyance seemed fairly at an end, and judging from the rise of his thermometer, which I held in my hand, there succeeded an increase of the pleasure heat which I had hardly anticipated. The result was 
that eagerly availing himself of the lessons I had given him, he set to work so deliciously and exerted himself so much to promote my pleasure, that in spite of my efforts to prolong the enjoyment, he drew down for me in a very few minutes the first flow that had saturated his virgin premises. After some little fondling of each other, he again wished to repeat the operation. I told him I was afraid of his exerting himself too much, and proposed that we should put it off till morning. But he would not be satisfied with this, and urged me to comply by appealing to an argument, the strength and beauty of which I could not withstand. Again, this fascinating charmer was plunged into my interior with the same lascivious results, and again I was rewarded for my compliance by the full enjoyment of his delicious charms, and after we had each thus attained again to the height of felicity, we fell asleep, locked in a close embrace. I awoke early in the morning before he did, and I delighted myself with a view of all his naked charms while he still slumbered. I was unwilling to awaken him even to satisfy my own raging desires inflamed by the sight of such beauty, for I saw that his lovely champion was, already raising his head proudly aloft, as fiercely as if he had not undergone any fatigue on the previous night, and I was convinced that if he once awoke, nothing would prevent him from at once commencing and continuing the delightful game till it was time to appear at breakfast. I therefore resolved to keep quiet as long as possible, and creeping gently as close to him as I could, I placed my throbbing weapon in the hollow between his buttocks, and in that delicious position, remained quiet until he awoke. When he did open his eyes, he turned his head round, and finding how he was situated, and that I had been awake for some time, he scolded me for wasting so much valuable time. And while he took hold of and insinuated my pleasure a jiver into the appropriate niche with which it was in such close contact, he vowed that he was much disposed to punish me by not allowing him to enter. The joys of the previous evening were repeated. He his turn penetrated into my interior, and reveled in the same lascivious enjoyment. After we had each thus allayed our fires a little by a copious discharge, we proceeded to a minute examination of our respective persons. While I was highly delighted with the unrestrained exhibition of such charms as have seldom fallen under my notice, I found that he was no less struck and pleased with what I in return placed at his disposal. Anything of the kind he had previously seen had been of boys of his own age, and this merely by stealth, when he had no opportunity of making minute observations. My somewhat more mature proportions, occasioned by the difference of a few years in our ages, were therefore fully appreciated and drew from him the warmest encomiums and the most luxurious caresses. While Frank and I were thus agreeably occupied in a minute investigation of each other's charms, I reverted to what had fallen from him the previous evening, and asked if he really meant to say that his sister was in the habit of visiting him after he had gone to bed. Not now, he replied. I only wish she did, and I would soon repay her the lessons she used to give me. Do you know it was she who first taught me how to do anything in this way? I expressed my surprise and curiosity to know what had occurred between them, and he at once proceeded to enlighten me saying that from the kindness I had shown him, he was sure he need have no reserve with me. It was, he said, about eighteen months ago when she had returned from school, that our first amusement began. We then slept in the same rooms we now occupy, and as some of my younger brothers were in the room where you are, I used often to lock the door at night to prevent them from coming in and tormenting me. Laura used generally to come to bed before her aunt. She somehow ascertained that I shut myself up in my room, and probably imagined that I was better informed on certain subjects than I really was. One evening on which there were some old people at dinner who were likely to occupy our aunt's attention and keep her up late, Laura said to me that she was tired of the party in the drawing room, but that she was not inclined to sleep, and that if I left the door open between our rooms, she would come and sit with me for a while. I sat up for some time, expecting to hear her come to her room but at length I grew tired of waiting, undressed, and went to bed. I suspected she must have crept softly to her own room, and waited there without my being aware of it till this took place, for I had hardly got into bed and put out the candle when I heard her come in. She came to the bedside and inquired in a low voice if I was awake. 
on my answering her. She said we had better not talk loud in case of disturbing the young people in the next room. She sat down by the bedside and leaned over me, putting an arm round my neck and kissing me warmly. Then, putting her hand under the bedclothes, she began to caress my naked bosom. This seemed a little strange to me, but very pleasant, and it was still more agreeable when, putting my arm round her neck, I found that she also was undressed and had nothing but her night shift and a dressing gown which was quite open at the front. This she accounted for by saying she must be ready to slip into bed if she heard her aunt coming. The touch of her naked breasts, which were then just beginning to acquire their full, round form, quite delighted me. And it was while playing with them that the first voluptuous sensations were awakened within me. I had previously been sometimes surprised, especially on awakening in the morning, to find a certain little gentleman quite hard and stiff, and had been at a loss to ascertain what was the cause. And I was now still more surprised that as I played with her soft, yielding globes, the same effect occurred. But although the sensation was most agreeable, I was too ignorant regarding such matters to be able to connect the cause with the effect. Lara continued to kiss and play with me for some time, and at last I became aware that while with one hand she caressed me, the other was employed in some movement about her own person, the object of which I did not understand and did not think of investigating. The effect, however, seemed to be pleasant to her, for her kisses and caresses increased in ardor till, at last, with a heavy sigh, they ceased at once, and she remained for a few minutes perfectly still. Then, after another kiss, she said she was afraid her aunt might come and find her away. So, making me promise to say nothing of her visit, she left me. Our interview had been so agreeable to me that I pressed her to renew it on the succeeding night, which she willingly agreed to do, and somewhat of the same procedure occurred on that and several subsequent occasions. I gradually began to discover that, as her caresses increased, and as her hand came to wander lower down on my person, effect which was produced upon a certain part came to increase in force and to be accompanied with more pleasant sensations. This aroused a suspicion in my mind that there must be some connection between them. So one night, when my little plaything was particularly stiff, and she was very much excited, I took her hand which had never before strayed below my navel and, certainly by no means unwillingly on her part, drew it down and placed it on the throbbing object that had raised my curiosity. She made not the least objection to my making her grasp it, and after handling it for a little, she asked me what was the meaning of it and what I wanted her to do with it. I said I did not know, but that I suspected she knew better than I did, as it was only when she played with me that it became in its present state. She laughed and asked me if it gave me any pleasure for her to play with it. I told her it did and begged of her to continue to fondle it. She complied very willingly and then began to question me how long it was since it had commenced to get in two. This state, and whether I had ever played with it myself, or done anything to procure myself pleasure with it, I told her that it was only of late that it had often been in the way of getting stiff, and explained how much it had been affected by her caresses. She then said she thought she might perhaps be able to procure for me still greater pleasure with it, but that it would take a little time to do so, and as she could not remain long enough that night, she would come back and try what she could do on the first favorable opportunity. The next evening she complained of a headache and retired to bed earlier than usual. As soon as she came into my room, she lighted my candle, stripped down the bedclothes, made me take off my nightshirt, and at once began to amuse herself with my little plaything. It swelled out and increased in size under her playful fondling to an extent that surprised me. After she had satisfied her curiosity respecting it and its appendages by a strict examination of every part, she took it in her hand and we began to rub it up and down. She then put out the candle so that I did not see what was probably the case while endeavoring to procure me pleasure. She was at the same time operating upon herself for the same agreeable purpose. I certainly very much enjoyed her performance upon my sensitive article, but still I felt as if something was wanting and I was greatly disappointed when, as usual, she sunk almost fainting on my bosom and ceased her effort. After a little, she recovered herself 
and said she was afraid I was still too young to be able to enjoy the full pleasure of what she had been doing, but that she would try again the following night. Still two or three nights passed without anything occurring to heighten my enjoyment. By this time I had begun to express some curiosity with regard to her person, and to wish to be allowed to extend my researches over it as freely as her hands roved over mine. With some little difficulty I prevailed on her to remove her dressing gown and night shift and stretch herself naked on the bed beside me. I had been aware from what I had seen of some little girls that there was a considerable difference in our formation. But I was astonished at first on finding her center part so thickly shaded with hair. I quite delighted with its beauty, was soon tempted to get my fingers between the moist ruby lips of the charming little slit which I discovered within the curly forest, and to begin to explore its recesses. The sensitive little organ I found within so closely resembling, though on a smaller scale my own organ of pleasure, did not escape my observation, as wakened up by my lascivious touches it darted its little head out from its hiding place. It was not long before I discovered that this invasion of her inmost recesses occasioned Laura the greatest to life. She seemed at first to hesitate a little, but summing up courage, she took hold of my hand and, inserting my fingers within the warmly moist cavity, made me move it up and down within her. At the same time, she grasped my weapon and rubbed it backwards and forwards more rapidly and more forcibly than she had ever done before. I felt greatly excited and continued the titillating movements of my finger within her with the greatest zest until I saw her stretch her legs out and sink backwards on the bed sobbing violently, while with quick hurried movements of her buttocks, she responded to every thrust I made in her inflamed interior. These violent motions only lasted a few seconds, and then I felt something wet apparently issue from her, trickle over my fingers and down her thighs. She still retained her grasp of my machine, which I felt throbbing and burning more fiercely than ever, and giving me more pleasure than I had ever previously experienced, though in her crisis of delight she had ceased to operate upon it. I now begged of her not to stop, but to continue her employment which afforded me so much delight. Suspecting what was indeed the case, that the sight of her charms and of the enjoyment she had undergone had stirred me up to an unwanted pitch of desire, which might perhaps be attended with a happy result. She good-naturedly resumed her efforts, and every succeeding movement of her hand upon the throbbing and inflamed member evidently added intensely to the flame that consumed me. She persevered until she had produced the desired result, and I saw a drop or two of white liquid burst from the inflamed point, while at the same time a most delicious sensation pushed through the part affected, and from thence seemed to thrill through my whole frame, as overcome with the exquisite delight. I fell back upon the bed, she kissing me tenderly and congratulating me on having at length attained the powers of a man. Then she left me to my repose. After this, we omitted no opportunity that was afforded us of amusing ourselves together in the same way. My ignorance on the subject, however, prevented me from thinking of carrying our enjoyment farther. And though doubtless she knew better, she allowed me to return to school without enlightening me any farther. She made me promise two things. First, that I was not to indulge myself in any repetition of our pastimes until we met again. And secondly, not to say anything to my schoolfellows regarding such subjects. I cannot say that I kept my promise on either point. I tried as well as I could to do so with regard to the first, that I could not help occasionally breaking through. But my curiosity was too much excited by our late proceedings not to endeavor to ascertain how some of my elder companions felt regarding such subjects. On sounding them cautiously, I discovered that some of them were better informed on such affairs than I was, and from their revelations I became aware of the amount of pleasure I had lost through my want of knowledge to avail myself of it. It so happened that during the following year, whenever I was at home, Laura was absent, and when we did at length occasionally meet, and I endeavored to prevail on her to afford me an opportunity of repeating our old amusements. She always put me off, laughing and saying that I was grown too old for her to allow me to play these tricks now. 
so that I never have been able to show her what a change had taken place in the size of her old acquaintance or to prove to her how much pleasure I am sure it could now give her. This detail produced such an exciting effect upon both of our organs of pleasure that we were obliged again to quench our raging fires in each other's interiors. In the course of the mutual operation, I questioned him as to whether, if he had an opportunity, he would like to repeat his former amusements with Laura, and even carry them further. He said at once it would be most delightful to do so, and nothing would give him greater pleasure. Then, referring to her close neighborhood to us, and to her aunt's approaching departure, he said that there would be such a capital opportunity for our all enjoying ourselves together if she could only be persuaded to agree to it, that he was determined to try whether he could not persuade her to renew their meetings. And he even showed me a key to the door leading into her room, which he had got made on purpose to enable him to have access to her. His story had somewhat enlightened me as to Laura's ideas, and I could now understand to some degree her not feeling so much annoyed as I had been at Frank's arrival. I strongly suspected that rather than be deprived of her favorite amusement, she would not object to his again being a participator in it. I thought it better, however, not to say anything to him at present regarding my intimacy with her, until I had ascertained what her intentions really were. After mutually agreeing that we were both to endeavor to prevail on her to join in our sports, and that if one succeeded, he was to do all he could for the benefit of the other, we went down to breakfast. I had an opportunity, sooner than I expected, of coming to an explanation with Laura. She had told me that she could not meet me that morning at the summer house, but in the course of the forenoon she found she could get away for an hour, and she gave me the usual signal for me to repair there. When, as she was accustomed to do, she opened my trousers and uncovered her little darling and proceeded to give him his usual caress. Before introducing him into his nest, her quick eye at once discovered that he was not in his ordinary trim to satisfy her desires. With a flushed cheek, she looked me full in the face and asked what was the reason of this and what I had been about to occasion such a state of things. I was very well pleased to have such a good opportunity of coming to the point, and I at once answered that, having been deprived of the pleasure of seeing her in the morning and despairing of being able to accomplish a meeting with her that day, I had been reduced to the necessity of seeking consolation in the embraces of one whose charms put me so much in mind of her that I had almost believed it was her in reality and had been tempted to exceed the limits I had intended to have placed upon myself. She inquired with some heat and astonishment what I meant, but she blushed scarlet when I replied that Frank and I had been rehearsing some of her lessons. She was at first rather annoyed at what I told her, but when I explained to her that I had not made Frank aware of what had passed between us, until I was sure of her approbation and that his reason for confiding in me was the hope of my being of use in enabling him to obtain the bliss he so much coveted off again regaling himself, in her charm she was quite appeased. I had little difficulty in discerning that she was highly delighted with the glowing description I gave of his youthful charms, and especially of the size and prowess of her old acquaintance. I dwelt on this and on the necessity there was of taking him into our confidence, and even making him a partner in our amusements. Unless we were to give them up entirely, for there could be no doubt if we went on that he would soon discover the footing we were on. Although I could not get her to say that she would consent to this, I was tolerably well satisfied she would make no great opposition. I therefore ceased to urge the point, telling her that she must leave it to me to arrange matters with Frank. If I found it was necessary, and that I would take care not to commit her more than was absolutely requisite. We had continued to caress each other during this conversation, and her charms producing their usual effect upon me. I was soon able to point out to her the flourishing condition of her favorite. I exerted myself, notwithstanding my previous night's work, to show her that it had not quite exhausted me, and at length she left me quite reconciled by the result of three vigorous encounters. When Frank came to me that night, he was somewhat surprised at the state of my rather enervated champion, which he with great glee contrasted with the vigorous condition of his own. But he was still more surprised when I frankly confessed 
that I could not attempt to cope with him on that occasion, and explained the cause from which the deficiency arose. He was greatly delighted to learn the footing on which I stood with Laura, and at once concluded that she would not be able to resist the temptation of adding to her enjoyment by making him participate in it. I quite agreed with him, but at the same time I told him the objection she had made, and that it would probably be necessary to devise some plan by which at least the appearance of her not voluntarily complying with his desires might be kept up. After some deliberation on this subject, occasionally interrupted by a renewal of our previous evening's amusements, in which, however, I generally allowed my young friend to take the more active share, we arranged our plan which was carried into effect in this manner. Laura was now afraid to venture to the summer house every morning, so we had few opportunities of meeting, but ascertaining that her mother and her aunt were going two days afterwards to pay a visit at a distance, which would occupy them the whole forenoon, I arranged with her that if she were left alone, she should come to my room where I would be waiting for her. I then arranged with Frank that at breakfast he should say he was going to take a ride to call upon a companion in the neighborhood, but that instead of doing so he should have doing so, conceal himself in a closet in my room, and upon my giving a certain signal, he should make a noise which would lead to his discovery, without it appearing that I knew he was there. Everything happened as I anticipated. As soon as the carriage drove off with her mother, Laura came to my room, where I was awaiting her, saying that it seemed an age since I had had the opportunity of fully enjoying the sight and touch of all her charms. I at once stripped myself quite naked and proceeded to perform the same operation upon her. As she enjoyed this as much as I did, she made no objection whatever, and even assisted in getting rid of her clothes as fast as possible. I placed her in several different postures, in order to allow the delighted boy to enjoy the voluptuous sensations I was sure her charms would produce upon him, and then proceeded to the final enjoyment. When this had been completed to our mutual satisfaction, I again displayed all her attractions, and when by kisses and caresses, and lascivious touches I had again roused her desires for a repetition of the encounter, I made the agreed and signal to Frank. He immediately responded by pushing down some article of furniture. Laura started up, exclaiming, Good heavens! What is that? Can anyone be there? I jumped out of the bed and seized a pistol which was lying on the dressing table and opened the door saying I would take good care to silence any intruder, so that he should never be able to tell upon us. On opening the door, and disclosing Frank, I exclaimed, So it is you, Master Peeping Tom. Well, it is lucky it is only you, for anyone else would have had a good chance of having a bullet through his head. But I shall deal somewhat differently with you. Don't suppose, however, you are to get off unpunished for thus stealing in upon us. I see there is a good rod here and you shall have a sound flogging for your impertinence and curiosity. So strip instantly, and remember the longer you are about it, the more severe your punishment will be. Frank appeared nothing loath to submit to the proposed infliction, and with my assistance was soon as naked as we were. All this time, I watched Laura closely to observe how she was affected by our proceedings. At first she had been dreadfully alarmed, but on finding it was only Frank, she was quite aware she was perfectly safe. As I proceeded to strip him, and disclosed his exquisite figure and symmetrical proportions, she evidently became much interested, and when at last I drew his shirt over his head and revealed the full contour of his body with his delicious charmer, standing fully erect and exhibiting its rosy head completely developed, I could see a flash of pleasure and a light steal over her lovely features, and impart still greater animation to her sparkling eyes. Convinced that I might now proceed to any extremities, I said, Now, Laura, you must assist me to punish this young rogue properly. I then gave her the rod, and sitting down on the side of the bed, I placed him across my knees, and turned up his beautiful posteriors to her. She instantly entered into the sport, and gave him two or three cuts with the birch, which, though not very severe, were quite sufficient to give him an excuse for tossing his legs about and exhibiting all his charms in the most voluptuous manner possible, in which I gave him every assistance in my power. After this playful enjoyment had been continued for some time, 
I said to Laura that she was too gentle with him, and did not punish him half so severely as he deserved, and proposed that she should change places with me and let me take the rod. She laughingly assented and asked me in what position she was to hold him for me. I told her the best plan would be to do as they flogged the boys at school, and I would show her how it was done. Making her lean forward upon the bed, I placed him behind her, and putting his arms over her shoulders, I made her catch hold of his hands, telling her to hold them fast. She did as I directed, while I applied a few lashes to his plump, handsome posteriors, which, as I expected, made him cling closely to Laura. Bringing his instrument into direct contact with her buttocks, against which it beat furiously, as if eager to effect an entrance somewhere, I said, Ah, I see you've got a very unruly little gentleman there. I must try if we can't hold him fast also. And at the same time I inserted it between her thighs and again, inflicted a few blows. The near approach of his furious weapon to the seat of pleasure caused him to make fierce efforts to endeavor to penetrate it, and I could no longer resist the imploring glances he cast upon me, expressive of his urgent desire that I should enable him to complete his enjoyment. So making Laura rest her belly on the bed and stretch her legs as far as under as possible so as to afford him a fair entrance from behind, I loosened her hold of his arms so far as arms to enable him to stoop down sufficiently low, and then taking hold of his flaming weapon, I guided it into the heaven, which I felt was burning with desire, and eager to receive it. Lara at once accommodated herself to all his proceedings, and finding that her hold of his hands rather obstructed his progress, she loosened it, and they were soon transferred to her splendid swelling globes, and then— as he became more and more excited in the hot struggle, were firmly clasped round her waist, so as to bring their bodies into the closest possible contact. Animated by the delicious scene before my eyes, the fiery impatience of my excited organ of pleasure could no longer be restrained. I threw myself on the lovely boy, and almost at the first thrust was plunged up to the hilt in the delicious buttocks which he thus so temptingly exposed to my eager assault. Once engulfed, I had nothing to do but to keep my place and leave to the energetic struggles of the other two combatants the task of bringing the warfare to a successful termination. After a hard fight, during which the utmost endeavors of both parties seemed to be to try which should be vanquished soonest, it terminated in a drawn battle. And as I contributed at the same time my share of the spoil, poor Frank's beautiful little balls of delight were quite inundated both before and behind with the stream, which flowed from himself and me, and which mingled with the first tribute his manly prowess had drawn down from woman, and poured in torrents along his thighs. The dear boy was so overcome with the delight that I thought at first he must have fainted, but I soon discovered it was only the swoon of pleasure. Raising him up in my arms as soon as I could disengage my unruly member from the pleasant quarters it still clung to, I laid him on the bed by the side of Laura, who was not in much better condition, and stood equally in need of my assistance. It is wonderful, however, how soon one recovers from such exhaustion, and in a few minutes they were both as lively as ever, and were actively engaged in the mutual contemplation of each other's exquisite charms. This pleasant proceeding was enlivened by an animated discussion regarding the alteration and improvement, which each of them discovered the others, beauties had undergone, since they had last been, submitted to their mutual inspection, and it cannot be doubted that Laura was greatly delighted to witness the change in size of the pretty little champion to which she had given the first lesson. All this, of course, produced the usual effect upon us— and Frank, seeing that I was quite ready to renew the combat, proposed to resign Laura to me. I fancied, however, that they would like a repetition of their previous engagement, and he was evidently perfectly able to renew it. For indeed, the wanton boy had been so wound up by the preliminary scene that his former encounter had produced hardly any relaxing effect upon his lovely weapon. I therefore drew him upon the not unwilling Laura, and again guiding the fiery courser into the lists of pleasure, had the satisfaction of seeing. Then once more commenced the amorous encounter, which proceeded to the ordinary happy result, 
evidently to the great delight of both parties. Frank, reveling in the blissful conjunction of every part of their naked bodies, clasped Laura round the neck and imprinted burning kisses upon her lovely lips. While his rampant steed plunged violently backwards and forwards in the abyss of pleasure, and his charming buttocks bounded and quivered with the excess of wanton delight. Greatly interested in watching the delightful encounter, I endeavored to promote their enjoyment by tickling and playing with a them in the most sensitive places, till their excitement reached its height, and they both sunk down in the swoon of pleasure. Laura had no sooner recovered a little from the effects of this engagement, then Frank insisted on seeing me perform the same pleasant operation in which he had just been engaged. Nothing loth. I immediately humored his fancy, getting upon Laura, who was still lying on her back in the bed. The lascivious and not yet exhausted boy had no sooner got us fairly placed, and my weapon inserted in Laura's sheath and set to work. Then I felt him separate our legs so as to enable him to kneel down between them behind us. Having established his position satisfactorily, he instantly plunged his still rampant champion into my rear, producing in me the most rapturous sensations, which soon caused me in conjunction with Laura to die away in bliss before he was ready to join our sacrifice. Finding that he was determined to complete his third pleasing operation, I proposed that he should change his position and take up my place in Laura's palace of pleasure and allow me again to stimulate him in the rear and assist him to attain his object. He highly approved of this proposal, and immediately took up his position in Laura's arms, while, getting behind him and inserting my weapon in his delicious sheath, I proceeded to render him the same agreeable service he had just done me. This speedily had the desired effect, and a delicious emission from all the three parties brought our undertaking to a most successful and satisfactory conclusion. By this time, Laura for once had had enough to satisfy her, and we separated, sadly grudging the loss of the two. Days which were still to pass before the departure of her aunt would admit of a renewal of our joys in security. We faithfully proposed on our part that we should be abstinent in the meantime, with the view of being the better, able to enjoy ourselves thoroughly, when the happy time for our all-again meeting together should arrive. Upon the whole, with the assistance of an occasional solace from her in the summer house, when an opportunity afforded, we kept our promise tolerably well. Though as Frank would insist on coming to my bed, and we could neither of us refrain from indulging in a side of each other's charms, it was sometimes a hard struggle to restrain our desires. At length Miss Middleton's departure enabled us to give free course to all our wanton inclinations, and night after night my room was the scene of a repetition of the most exquisite and voluptuous enjoyments it is possible to conceive. When our exhausted frames could no longer furnish us with the means of indulging in the performance of our soul-stirring rites, we were never tired of gazing on and caressing the delicious forms which were constantly exhibited without reserve for the delectation and amusement of one another. For we all seemed to feel that our own delight was heightened by aiding to promote the happiness of the others. We had no secrets from Laura, in fact. She had witnessed with delight the pleasures which Frank and I mutually conferred upon each other. On one occasion when she was disqualified from joining in our amusements, she watched Frank and me stripping and enjoying by ourselves the pleasures she was unable to participate in. The evident delight they afforded us affected her so greatly that she declared she must try the effect of the same operation upon herself. Accordingly, the next night she insisted upon us both operating on her at the same time. Frank offered to me the choice of roots. But as I was aware that he had often contemplated with great pleasure the idea of opening up the new way, which he thought would be peculiarly well suited to his yet somewhat undeveloped proportions, I at once gave him the precedent. I told him that, as I had already had one victory over a maiden citadel, it was only fair that he should enjoy the next, and that it was better he should do so as in all probability he would obtain it with less suffering to the conquered fair one than if my larger battering ram were at first introduced. Laura quite approved of this arrangement. Having all stripped quite naked, I laid myself down in the bed at full length and then drew her upon me, making her place herself so as to bring her cavity just over the stiff pole, which was standing up ready to enter it. 
she herself inserted and adjusted it in the most satisfactory manner. When she was quite impaled upon me and firmly fastened by the wedge, being fairly driven home in her, Frank got between her legs on his knees, and with lance in hand, proceeded to insert it in her hinder cavity. Being, however, his first attempt at storming a maiden fortress, he was not very expert at it, and the coveted way proving very narrow and confined. It was not without some difficulty he effected his object. The obstacles, however, only increased the ardor of his desires, and, with the assistance of a little cold cream, they were at length happily surmounted, and his weapon forced its way into the interior of the citadel. During this time I endeavored to keep as quiet as possible, and as Frank's efforts occasioned her some pain, Laura Alza remained nearly motionless, only exerting herself a little occasionally to humor his movements and assist him in effecting an entrance. As soon, however, as I found from his exclamation of delight that his weapon had overcome all resistance and was as fully embedded in the lascivious, fleshy sheath as mine was, I began at first gently and quietly, and then more rapidly and vigorously, to join in the combat, heaving my buttocks up and down and urging the lusty pole backwards and forwards in its delicious quarters only pausing now and then to receive and return the burning kisses which Laura, now rendered quite frantic with the double enjoyment stimulating her both before and behind, showered upon me. I soon found that any further efforts on my part were quite unnecessary. Maddened by the novel excitement, Laura heaved and thrust alternately, displacing and replacing the sturdy instruments above and below and declaring she really knew not which of them afforded her the greatest delight. I, therefore, confined myself to favoring her movements so as to give them the greatest possible effect, till at last with her eyes flashing fire, and her whole body panting and heaving with the excess of her emotion, she almost shouted out, Oh, heavens, this is too much! Her grasp round me slackened, and she sunk and trounced on my bosom while Frank and I responded to her call, and a few frantic heaves on both our parts uh, served to cause our rivers of delight to flow into her where, mingling with her own flood, they somewhat served to calm our overexcited senses. It was some time before Laura came to herself, but when she did she was delighted to find that we still retained our respective positions within her. On my inquiring whether they felt disposed for a renewal of the combat in a similar manner, they both declared with the most impassioned caresses that nothing would give them greater delight, telling Frank that as the entrance to both fortresses was now well lubricated, we might venture to carry on the warfare more boldly without the risk of doing any damage. I desired him to keep time with me and thrust his weapon as far in and out as he could at each heave, first alternately with me, and then on a given signal both together. At the same time I advised Laura to remain quiet and try what would be the effect of our efforts. The result far surpassed her expectations. When, after heaving alternately for some little time, I gave Frank the signal, and we made a simultaneous thrust together. Burying both our weapons as far as they would go within the soft yielding flesh, she exclaimed, Oh, this is exquisite. It could not possibly be more heavenly. We continued this mode of action for some time, alternately changing from one variety to another, while she responded merely by twisting and wriggling her butter, and in turn compressing and squeezing the darling object before or behind, which for the moment affected her senses the more powerfully. Gradually, however, she became too much animated to adhere to any settled plan, and she could not refrain from meeting and returning our lusty efforts to promote her enjoyment. This only animated us to fresh exertions, in which we were so successful that we were soon rewarded by as overpowering an overflow of bliss as before. As soon as it was over, she insisted on laying us both out at full length on the bed quite naked, bringing our organs of pleasure so close together that she could caress them at the same time, and placing herself upon us so that her mouth came in contact with them. In this position she remained for a long time kissing, caressing, and sucking the instruments of delight and thanking us in the warmest manner 
for the excessive joy we had given her, until her luscious caresses, exciting us almost to madness, forced us again to allay the irritation produced on our burning weapons by again bringing them into her delightful sheaths. In such exquisite amusements a few weeks passed rapidly away without any interruption to our joys. When we were startled by learning from Laura that there was a derangement of the usual symptoms which she feared indicated pregnancy, this greatly alarmed us, for trusting to our youth we had had no fear on this subject. I lost no time in consulting an eminent London surgeon, but his reply was that the symptoms were usual in cases of pregnancy, but that they were not infallible signs of it, as they sometimes occurred from other causes. It was, however, obvious that some arrangement must be made to provide for the occurrence of the possible event. I, of course, told Laura that if it should turn out as she feared, we must make up our minds to run off together and getting up a story of her having been previously privately married, keep out of the way until the noise of the affair blew over. This plan, however, did not meet her approbation. She said that whatever might really have been the case, everyone would at once say from the difference in our ages that she must have seduced me, and that she would never be able to show her face again in society, and that, moreover, she could not think of inflicting such a penalty on me as to saddle me for life with a wife older than myself, when she had been as much to blame in the matter as I had. After a great deal of consideration, I ventured to hint whether her best plan would not be to accept Sir Charles Tracy, marry him at once, and get the ceremony over without delay, so that if a child did come, there might be at least the lapse of six months to admit of the possibility of his being the father. I must here explain that Sir Charles had been an almost constant resident at the hall ever since my arrival, and was evidently looked upon by the family as a suitor. He was a young man of about twenty-seven, of large fortune, tall, handsome, and well-made, not particularly clever, but almost the best-tempered and most good-natured person I ever met. His object in remaining so long was quite obvious. Although she would never admit it, I had all along fancied that Laura liked him, but since I had become so intimate with her, she certainly had shown more coldness towards him than she did on my first arrival. At first, Laura said this plan would never do, but, as we could devise nothing else, on my pressing her a little on the subject she admitted, that before I came, she had made up her mind to accept him if he proposed but that she was afraid to do so now for two reasons first. She feared he might discover on his first attack that someone had had access before him to the sanctuary of love, and secondly, from the dread that in the event of a child coming before the usual time, he might denounce her and turn her adrift. I considered a little, and then asked her whether if these difficulties could be got over she would still be disposed to marry him. She said it was no use thinking of it but that if it were not for the objections she had mentioned, she certainly would, as she thought she could live happily with him. I then told her that as to the first objection she might set her mind perfectly at ease, for from what I had already seen of Sir Charles, his instrument I knew was so much larger than anything that had found its way into her, and he would find so much difficulty in getting it in for the first time that he would never suspect any intruder had been before him, and that if, as she easily might, she insisted in the operation being performed in the dark. I could supply her with a contrivance by which a little red liquid might be applied, so as to produce the natural appearance of an effusion of blood. Then, as to the second objection, I told her I thought there would be little fear of his making any complaint, at least in public, on the subject. If she had the power to hold out to him that she could bring forward a matter which it would be equally unpleasant for him to have disclosed. She said that in such a case the matter might perhaps be arranged, but she could not imagine how she was to obtain such a hold over him. I told her I thought she might leave that to me. I then explained to her that Sir Charles had taken a fancy to me on my arrival, and had shown me every kindness and attention, evidently wishing to be on an intimate footing with me. The poor fellow no doubt was in an awkward predicament, inflamed by the constant sight of the charms of Laura of whom he was greatly enamored, he was afraid to console himself in the arms of any of the women in the neighborhood for fear. His infidelity might come to her knowledge, 
and unable wholly to restrain his desire to give vent in some manner to his pent-up passions. He had made some overtures to me, of which I clearly understood the meaning, though with Laura, Betsy, and Frank on my hands, I had quite enough to do in that way, and consequently I had pretended not to understand his intentions. I now suggested to Laura that by complying with his wishes I might get him to come to my room, where she and Frank would have an opportunity of seeing us enjoy each other, so that if at any future period he should accuse her of infidelity prior to her marriage, she might retort upon him. Laura was quite satisfied that, if this could be accomplished, she would be perfectly safe, as with his good temper, she said she had little doubt, even in case of the worst we dreaded occurring. She would be able to persuade him that it would be for the interests of both that he should keep quiet. Seeing she had such a hold over him, she now admitted that she really was fond of him, though her curiosity and my boldness had lately enabled me to gain the advantage over him. And I easily drew from her that she did not like him the less for the report I had made of his evident ability to perform satisfactorily in the battles of Venus. I therefore told her that, though I was afraid that the performance of the instrument that would probably afford the greatest pleasure to her might prove to be martyrdom to me. I was prepared to undergo it for her sake, and we signed and sealed the agreements in our usual happy way. As I have always found that where a thing is once determined on it, is better to lose no time in carrying it into execution. I set to work immediately. I dressed for dinner that day sooner than usual, and about half an hour before the ordinary dinner hour, I made my way to Sir Charles' room, taking with me an amorous work he had lent me, and making a pretext of wishing to borrow another. When he found who it was that knocked at the door, he asked me to come in, saying that he wanted to see me as he had that day received a packet from town, with some things he had ordered down for me. He then told his servant to lay out some things for him, and that he would not be required further. As soon as the servant had left the room, he took from a drawer a large parcel, and selecting a packet of drawings, told me to sit down and amuse myself with them while he finished dressing. This was coming to the point even sooner than I had anticipated, but as it was just the opening I wanted, I sat down and began to examine the drawings, which consisted of a most beautifully executed series of voluptuous designs. When he addressed himself, all except his coat and waistcoat, and he was a very few minutes about it. He came and leaned over me, looking at the drawings and making observations upon them. After we had gone over them, he said there were some more which he liked still better, and he hoped I would be equally well pleased with them. He went to the drawer for them, while I rose up to lay aside those we had been looking at. He selected two packets, and then coming back to the easy chair in which I had been sitting, he sat down, and wished to draw me on his knee. This, however, I did not allow, but I sat down on the arm of the chair allowing him to put his arm round my waist. He exhibited some more illustrations of luscious scenes, many of which were new to me, and I did not attempt to conceal the effect which was produced upon me. While I told him, which was the case, that I had never seen anything of the kind more beautifully designed and executed. I could see that he was watching the impression made not only on my face, but also on another part of my person, which had now become somewhat prominent. He seemed satisfied with this and then opened the other packet, which was a series of drawings executed by a first-rate artist in the most admirable style delineating the seduction of a beautiful young boy of about fifteen by another handsome youth, a few years older. Every scene in the progress was illustrated by an appropriate and admirably drawn portrait of the two characters, commencing with taking him on his knee and impressing the first amorous kiss the laying of his hand upon the organ of pleasure, the maiden bashfulness of first feeling the naked weapon grasped by a strange hand, the first starting out of the beautiful object on the trousers being, unloosen the full development of all its beauties on their being removed, the drawing his bridle over the fiery little head of the charger, the playing with the beautiful little appendices, they, opening the thighs to get a glimpse of the seat of pleasure behind, the turning him round to obtain a full view of the exquisite hindquarters, 
the first exposure to his gaze of the second actor in him. The scene of pleasure the making him caress and play with it the complete exposure of all their naked charms. As their shirts are drawn over their heads, the close embrace as they strain each other. In their arms the turning him round to present the altar for the sacrifice. The entrance, the combat, the ecstasy. The offering, the recompensing pleasure, the introducing the virgin weapon for the virgin weapon. First time, the ardor of the first enjoyment, the first tribute, and the mutual embrace of thanks, as they kissed and caressed each other's organs of pleasure, after the work happily was accomplished. All these were depicted with a beauty and a truth to nature that forcibly reminded me of my own sweet experience of similar enjoyment on my first initiation in the secrets of pleasure. As I gazed with admiration upon them, he could not help observing how much I was interested, and was no doubt encouraged to think, as I intended he should be, that there would be little objection on my part to his proceeding to enact a similar scene. His hand gradually slipped down over my stiffly distended weapon. I made a little faint resistance, but gradually allowed him, without much difficulty, to handle and feel it, to unloosen my trousers and make it appear on the stage. He had no sooner got possession of it than he loaded it with kisses and caresses, declaring that he had never seen anything to surpass it in beauty. He had not much more difficulty in loosening my braces and completely removing my trousers so as to give him a full opportunity of seeing and handling my naked person. I affected to be so much engrossed with the pictures as not to observe that he had not only done this, but had also drawn down his own trousers and raised up his shirt displaying his magnificent weapon. Until taking my hand he tried to make me grasp for my fingers could not meet round it be far the most splendid and largest champion I'd ever met with, one which, indeed, I had never seen surpassed. He seemed much amused by my surprised exclamation. Oh, goodness, what a monster! And laughing, asked if I had never seen one so large before. But on my expressing my wonder that he should ever get it into a woman at all, he seemed to be a little apprehensive that I might be too much frightened to allow it to enter where he wished it should go, and he tried to persuade me that, after all, there was not so very great a difference between it and mine. In truth, I had begun to be somewhat terrified on the subject and to wish at least to delay the operation. If it must be undergone, until it could be effected in a place where the object desired could be secured, I knew that in a few minutes the dinner bell would ring, and I therefore determined to temporize as long as possible, and escape on the present occasion by holding out hopes of his attaining his object on a more favorable opportunity. But I found that it was easier to make the resolution than to keep it. His evident passion for me, and the means he adopted to excite me to an ardor equal to his own keeping up a titillatory friction over the most sensitive points of my body soon produced their effect, and in spite of my resolution, I could not make any effort to oppose him. Having drawn me on his knees, he raised me up, and opening my buttocks and holding apart the lips of the orifice, he presented the enormous head of his charger and tried to gain admittance. He seemed to be aware that there must be considerable difficulty, and he not only anointed the parts with cold cream, but he also refrained from attempting to force it in by any violent exertion on his part, ironly wishing that the junction should be brought about in a manner that would run less risk of occasioning me pain by my pressing gently down upon it myself. This he urgently begged me to do, and I could not withhold feeling sensible of this attention to my feelings on his part. I thought it would be hardly fair of me not to show that I was so by at least endeavoring, as far as I could, to aid in accomplishing his wishes. I therefore pressed down upon the impaling stroke, with as much force as I could venture to exert, and with great difficulty and some pain to get the head fairly within the entrance. Having attained this, I desisted from my efforts for a moment, and was pleased to find that the pain ceased entirely. As for him, he was perfectly enchanted and loaded me with kisses and caresses. Just then the bell announced that dinner would be on the table in five minutes. Although I had previously been anxiously expecting this announcement, I must confess I felt sorry when it did come, for I had now got so interested and excited in our proceedings that I would willingly have contributed by every means in my power, 
even at any sacrifice of pain, to bring the enterprise to a successful termination. But there seemed no help for it, and I turned my head round to him and said that I was afraid we must go downstairs. He caught me round the neck, pressed my lips passionately to his, and entreated me to have patience with him for a few moments. He said he would not attempt to do anything that would give me more pain, but that he was then enjoying the most transcendent pleasure from the kind assistance I had already afforded him in getting his instrument so far, embedded in the abode of bliss. And if I would only allow him to remain where he was for a few seconds longer, he would be overwhelmed with the excess of his joy and would never cease to be grateful to me for having thus contributed to it. I could not resist his appeal, seeing clearly from his excited and flashing eyes that the tempest was nearly at its height and on the eve of bursting forth with all the fury of a torrent. He did not attempt to force his way further in, but supporting me with his arms, he wriggled and twisted his buttocks, making his weapon move about within me in the most surprising and delicious manner. Wishing to gratify and assist him as far as I could, I put one hand behind and grasping as well as I could the lower part of the splendid pillar. I rubbed and squeezed it, endeavoring to increase the excitement and promote his object, then passing the other hand between my thighs. I tickled and played with the massy round globes I found just beneath my own, and which instead of hanging down, pendant as at first, were now closely drawn up in their wondrous purse. He kissed me again fervently, and was in the act of thanking me for my kindness in thus increasing his pleasure, when he suddenly stopped short with a passionate exclamation of a single, Oh! My hand which grasped his splendid weapon was sensible of the instant rush of the fiery liquid through it. And the next moment, I felt the warm gush driven into my entrails as if it had been forced up by a pump. I continued the motion of my hand gently upon his instrument until the fit of pleasure was entirely over. Then, with some difficulty disengaging myself from the link that bound us together, I wiped the ruby head of the still rampant champion, and stooping down, first kissed it, and then his lips, as he still lay reclining in the chair, and then proceeded to arrange my dress. He soon recovered himself, and earnestly begged that I would come to his room that night, that he might have an opportunity of thanking me, and of endeavoring to repay, as far as he possibly could, the delicious treat I had afforded him. This, however, I would not promise to do, saying I was too much afraid of being seen when I could have no excuse for being in his room, but I allowed him to understand that I would try to devise some plan for another meeting. I contrived to give Laura a hint before dinner that all was right, and that she would get the details at night. She was so delighted with this that the distance and hauteur with which she had lately treated Sir Charles were greatly removed. And he on his part, animated by the scene which had just taken place and his victory as he thought, over my virgin charms, was more lively and bolder than usual, so that by the end of the evening they were on a better and more familiar footing than they had even been before. When the ladies retired to bed, Sir Charles again urged me to go to his room. I still refused, but at last I suggested that perhaps he might come to me early the next morning, as this would be less liable to suspicion, for if anyone saw him we might go out immediately together when it would be supposed he had only come for the purpose of calling me, while if he was not observed, he might remain for a time with me. Of course, that night I explained to Laura and Frank all that had passed, and we contrived to make two apertures in the partition wall of the closet between Frank's room and mine, from which they would have an uninterrupted view of the scene of operations. The next morning I heard Sir Charles open my door, but I lay quiet as if still asleep. I was conscious that he fastened the door, and then came round to the side of the bed where I was lying. He removed the bedclothes, raised up my nightshirt, and remained for some minutes contemplating me. Of course the principal object of his worship was my virile member, which, as was usual at that period of my life, always held up its head proudly erect when I awoke in the morning. I heard him undress himself and get into bed, and then kneeling down by my side, after kissing and caressing my organ of pleasure. He took the point of it into his mouth and commenced sucking it and moving it backwards and forwards between his lips. I opened my eyes, 
as if just awakened, and beheld him kneeling beside me, perfectly naked with his tremendous member standing stiff and erect. He immediately made me take off my shirt, and employed himself for a time in examining me all over, and caressing all my charms. During this time I also made a more minute inspection of my acquaintance of the preceding evening, and I was even more than ever astonished at its proportions, and at how I had managed ever to get it within my narrow aperture, as far as it had been. After some little time had elapsed in these preliminaries, he said that it was his turn now to contribute to my enjoyment, and taking hold of my weapon, he was going to turn himself away from where Laura and Frank were placed. As they had both been greatly interested by the account I had given them of Sir Charles' tremendous weapon, I wished that they should have an opportunity of seeing as much as possible of its proceedings. So I got him to change his position, and to place himself where they were, and where they could have the gratification of observing every motion he made in the approaching encounter. He immediately placed himself as I wished, and I then, at his request, took up my position behind him, and he proceeded to introduce my weapon into the sheath of pleasure. But if I had been surprised at the largeness of one of his proportions, I was no less so at the smallness of the other, as in fact, I had almost as much difficulty in getting into him as he had had with me. At length, with his assistance, I succeeded, and gradually penetrated within the delightful cavity, till I was completely embedded within it. Of course, the opposition I met with, and the extreme tightness of the place, when it was once fairly overcome, only increased the pleasurable sensations I experienced after I had fairly accomplished my entrance. When he found I was completely buried within him and was beginning to proceed with the work of pleasure, he took my hand and placed it on his majestic champion, saying that if I would be good enough to operate upon it at the same time, it would not only give him exquisite pleasure by being combined with the performance going on behind, but would also, by depriving it of a little of its vehement fury, make our after-proceedings more easy and agreeable to me. When, as he hoped I would allow him to do, he should again try to introduce it into the delicious aperture that had given him so much delight the previous day. I immediately acquiesced, and grasping as much of the pillar as I could manage to do with one hand, I commenced a series of movements upon it, gently rubbing it up and down and titillating the shaft as much as possible, which drew from him the warmest encomiums. In this manner, combining the movements of my hand in front with those of my excited weapon in the rear, I managed to pour my tribute into him at the same time that he sent a shower of loves, balsam, spouting beyond the bed far into the room. This scene acted so powerfully on Laura, that unable to restrain herself, as Frank afterwards told me, she seized hold of his hand, conveyed it to her pleasure spot, and made him cool her raging fever in a similar manner where she stood. Sir Charles then asked if I would allow him to endeavor to accomplish the undertaking which it had given him so much delight partially to accomplish the preceding day. I could not well make any objection, after having availed myself of his complacence, to his now proceeding to carry out his wishes to their entire fulfillment. I therefore disposed myself, so as to endeavor to stand the attacks in as favorable a position as I could, and at the same time afford my friends as good a view of the proceedings as was possible. I placed all the pillows and cushions I could find on a heap in the center of the bed, and lay down with my belly resting on them so as to raise up my posteriors and present them to him in an attitude that would be propitious to his purpose. He thanked me, and told me to let him know if I found that he hurt me too much, and he would at once stop, as he would be sorry to enjoy even such a gratification, if it were to be at the expense of occasioning me any suffering. He had provided some ointment with which he lubricated the whole of his weapon, and then with his finger inserted some of it in my aperture. He then applied the point of the dart to the mark, and endeavored to insert it. For some time it baffled his endeavors, the head slipping upwards and downwards, away from the entrance, whenever he attempted to thrust which he did very gently and carefully. I saw he was too much afraid of hurting me to be able to succeed, and getting excited myself by this time— put my hand between my thighs, and taking hold of his splendid weapon, I kept its head at the mouth of the aperture, 
and desired him to thrust a little more boldly, at the same time, trying to push back and stretch the aperture as much as possible, I met his advancing thrusts with all the firmness I could muster. This brought about the junction I desired, and again to his great delight, the head of his weapon got lodged between the extended lips of the aperture. The pain, however, of this proceeding was so great that I was obliged to ask him to pause till it should abate a little, which it very soon did. Then, summoning up courage, I told him to thrust again gently. This he hastened to do in the most delicate manner possible. The first few thrusts, till the upper part of the pillar got fairly inserted within the cheeks, were even worse than before. But as soon as this was accomplished, and the hollow part at the junction of the pillar with the head had passed the Rubicon, all feeling of uneasiness vanished, and was succeeded by the most delicious sensations. As inch by inch he gradually fought his way into my interior, the intense pleasure increasing at every thrust he gave, until the whole of the monster was fairly established within me, and I could feel the hair on his thighs and belly, in close contact with my buttocks, and his delightful soft bullets beating against mine at every motion he made. As soon as he was fully lodged to the utmost extent within the citadel, he stopped and inquired how I felt, and expressed the greatest satisfaction at finding my sufferings had now been converted into pleasure. After enjoying the voluptuous sensations of the elastic constriction, the nerves of the sheath in which it was plunged exerted upon his throbbing weapon for some minutes during which his hands roved over my body in nervous agitation. He resumed his delightful exercise, and thrust after thrust of his delicious weapon was driven into me with the most intense enjoyment to both parties. At length his lusty efforts were rewarded with success, and from the warm gush within me I felt that a torrent of bliss must have issued from him. While his nervous frame shook and quivered with blissful agitation and enjoyment, as the ecstasy of delight came over him, he lay for a few minutes bathed in enjoyment, and then raising his head, thanked me most fervently for all the bliss. I had conferred on him and expressed his hope that it had been accomplished without much suffering on my part. In answer, I gently turned both him and myself. On one side, too much delighted with its presence to allow his sword to escape from my scabbard, and made him look at the pillow on which my weapon had rested, and where a plenteous effusion of the balmy liquid plainly attested that I too had shared in the delights of his enjoyment. He expressed his great gratification at this, as he said the sole drawback to his enjoyment had been the fear that it had been attained at my expense, but he said that what he now saw emboldened him to make a new request and as the difficulty had now been overcome, to ask whether I might be persuaded to allow him still to retain his present quarter, and enjoy another victory, I readily agreed. I told him that the sensations produced upon me by the insertion of his weapon in so sensitive a place was so agreeable that it was so was indeed very evident from the thie, powerful manner in which it still affected mine, that he must allow it to remain quietly where it was for a time, and let me enjoy the agreeable sensation of its presence there. He said he could desire nothing better, and we lay for a considerable period thus pleasantly conjoined. During this time, I purposely turned the conversation upon Laura and Frank. I began by joking him about what Laura would say if she saw us in such a situation defrauding her of her just rights. He replied that he did not know what she would say, but that he knew what she ought to say or at least what he would say, if he were to find her in a similar situation. And that was that, as she could not assist in contributing to his happiness at present, she was very glad to find that he had been able to get somebody else who could. Then, said I, you would not be offended if she were to follow your example. No, certainly not, was his reply. I don't mean to say that I would not rather prefer that I should have her entirely to myself but I am so fond of her that if I found it would contribute to her happiness to enjoy herself with another, I should not make the slightest objection, provided she would only allow me to contribute to her enjoyment as much as I could. He went on to say that he was sadly afraid she would never allow him that pleasure, that he did once hope she might have been induced to accept him, 
But for the last few weeks, with the exception of the previous night, she had been colder than ever, and he was afraid to press her on the subject for fear of being at once rejected. I ventured cautiously to express my opinion that he was too distrustful of his own merits, and that he stood higher in Laura's favor than he seemed to imagine. He eagerly caught at my words, and asked on what grounds I thought so. He said he saw that from my old acquaintance with her as a boy. I was on more intimate terms with her than anyone else and more likely to understand her sentiments, and that he had often thought of speaking to me on the subject. Indeed, he said he would almost have been jealous of my influence with her, had I been a few years older, and had it not been that. Instead of appearing to be annoyed at his attentions to her, I had rather given him every opportunity to pursue them. As I felt he was watching me, I endeavored to keep my countenance as well as I could. But I was aware that the blood mounting in my cheeks must, to some extent, betray the secret interest I took in the subject. I go the best plan was to acknowledge that from our early intimacy, and the kindness she had always shown me, I did take a great interest in her, and that it was perhaps only my being sensible that she could neither look up to nor respect one so much younger than herself, that prevented this feeling from ripening into a warmer attachment, but that I was old enough to be able to wish to promote her happiness, even if I could not myself be the means of doing so, and that, from what I had seen of her feelings towards him, I had always thought they might be happy together, and consequently had wished him success. He pressed me very much regarding what she thought, or might have said of him. I told him that, of course, it was not a subject on which I could have ventured to speak to her seriously, that sometimes a looker-on saw more of the game than the players, and that I thought she did like him, and was only restrained from showing it more by his not urging his suit, so much as he perhaps might have done. We had some further conversation on the subject, and I added that I knew she was of a reserved disposition as regarded her own feelings, and did not like to have them noticed and commented on by strangers, and that perhaps the idea of all the parade and show which he might think necessary at the celebration of his marriage and the discussion of the matter for months previously might annoy her, while she would probably have been more easily induced to consent had he been a person of less rank and consequence when all this exhibition would have been avoided. He said that if she had any difficulty on this ground, nothing could be easier than to obviate it, for as far as he was concerned, it would give him the greatest satisfaction to dispense with all formalities, except necessary settlements which he would take care should not occupy much time, and they might be quietly married at their own church in the neighborhood, without making any fuss about it that with the exception of his mother and sister he had no relations he cared anything about or whom he would wish to be present, so that Laura could have everything her own way, without attempting to urge too much, I gave him to understand that I thought he had better come to an explanation with her as soon as possible and make her aware of his ideas on these points. And I promised to endeavor to ascertain her wishes as far as I could and make him acquainted with them. I had long felt by the unruliness of his member, which was deeply embedded within me, how powerful an impression the discussions of this subject produced upon him. He very soon disregarded my injunctions to keep quiet the delightful intruder, would keep wandering up and down in few. The path of pleasure and before our conversation was concluded, I felt the warm injection twice spouted into me. After this, he said he would not venture to trespass upon my kindness any further for the present, and urge me to take his place, which, excited as I was by his performances, I was very well disposed to do. He made every arrangement for my entering him in the most agreeable manner, inserting the weapon himself, and tickling and playing with the appendages. When fairly entered and enjoying myself to the utmost, I laughingly said that if he was going to run away with Laura, I could not hope for any long continuance of a, our present agreeable amusement, and I must try if I could persuade Frank to allow me to enjoy with him some of the pleasant pastimes he had been teaching me. He eagerly caught at the idea and urged me to do so, offering to leave with me all his books and pictures to show to him, and telling me to let him have any of them he liked, and at the same time begging me, 
if I succeeded, to allow him to join in our amusements, as the possession of one resembling Laura so much would be the next thing to enjoying herself. This was exactly what I wanted, for I felt satisfied that after having enjoyed the brother, he could never complain of anything the sister might do. Having then brought my enterprise to a satisfactory termination, I made him leave me, and joined Laura and Frank. Although they had been able to see everything, they had not heard all that passed. Coming to my bed, they proceeded to satisfy the burning desires, which the scene they had just witnessed had lighted up in them. While thus agreeably employed, I joked Laura about the martyrdom I had undergone for her sake, and what she was too. Look forward to suffer when she attempted to take in a stupendous instrument whose performances she had just seen. She did not appear to be much afraid of it, and said that judging from the manner in which I had apparently enjoyed its presence within me, there was not much reason for apprehension. But she eagerly asked what we had been talking about, as she had heard only so far as to make out that she was the subject of our discourse. She was quite delighted to find that the result had been so satisfactory, and it was at once resolved that, when Sir Charles pressed the matter, she would consent and that I should contrive to impress upon him the propriety of his urging the completion of the marriage with as little delay and ceremony as possible. Frank and I made up a party to ride with them that forenoon, and we took care to let them have an opportunity for an explanation. Laura was in a gracious mood, Sir Charles acted on my advice, pressed his suit, was accepted, explained his own wish to have the marriage concluded as soon as possible, but at the same time saying that in that point as on every other he should wish to consult her feelings in every respect, and was given to understand that her sentiments coincided with his. Having obtained her consent, he spoke to her father as soon as we returned from our ride, and as the settlements he proposed were most satisfactory, it was at once arranged, and it was settled that the marriage should take place within a month. When Sir Charles came to me the next morning, he was in ecstasies at the successful termination of his suit, which he asserted was in a great measure due to my good advice, and he urged me to attend him on the happy occasion. As this afforded a good excuse for my remaining at the hall, and being on a good footing with Laura, I readily agreed. Laura, having expressed a wish that they should be quiet during the few weeks she was to remain at home, it was arranged that the visits of some friends who were expected should be postponed. Her aunt, immediately on hearing of the marriage, returned to the hall, but I made Laura give her mother a hint that, though she did not like to say so to her aunt herself, she would prefer being allowed to enjoy the privacy of an apartment by herself. Her mother thought this was quite reasonable, and another room was prepared for Miss Middleton. Frank was allowed to remain at home till after the marriage, and we thus secured another month of our delightful pastime, to which we gave ourselves up without scruple or reserve. Sir Charles, though unwilling to tear himself away from the pleasure he was enjoying and anticipating, was obliged to go to town to make the necessary arrangements. I was desirous before he went to take a photographic view of him in the act of enjoying me, as I thought that in the event of Laura being obliged to have recourse to any compulsion upon him, her object would be better attained by making him aware she was in possession of such a picture than by any reference to me or explanation as to how she came to know anything on the subject. It was necessary for this purpose to bring Frank on the scene, as he was quite willing to join in the sport having been greatly taken with what he had witnessed of Sir Charles' operations. I told the latter that by means of his pictures I had come to a good understanding with him, and that he had agreed to comply with our wishes. Giving him to believe that there was a double maidenhead to be taken, I proposed that they should both be disposed of at the same time, and offered him his choice, which he would prefer. He said that if it was left to him to decide he would prefer to make the attack in the rear, and we settled that he should come to me the next morning when I could get Frank to meet us. Frank was in bed with me when Sir Charles arrived. I at once turned down the bedclothes, stripped off his shirt, and exhibited him quite naked, his fiery little dart, standing erect and unhooded, exhibiting its proportions in the most splendid manner. And I asked if he had ever seen anything more beautiful. He threw himself on the charming boy and covered every part of him with kisses, while I undressed him and 
reduced him to a similar state of nakedness as ourselves. As soon as this was done, I prepared Frank for the sacrifice. I was apprehensive that there would be as much difficulty in introducing the magnificent weapon into his lovely, but narrow aperture as there have been in my own case, and I endeavored to provide against the worst as satisfactorily as I could. I knelt down on the bed and made him place himself kneeling also, so as to rest his belly on my back. Sir Charles then placed himself behind him and grasped him firmly round the loins, making his splendid weapon appear between his thighs, where I saw it rubbing fiercely against Frank's less mature organ. Taking hold of it and making it move back a little, I introduced my hand between Frank's thighs and separating the lips. Of the delicious aperture between his lovely buttocks, I directed the point of the throbbing monster to the proper spot. Holding it firmly in the requisite position, I told Sir Charles to press it gently forwards. This he immediately did, and to my great astonishment I felt it gradually advancing and slipping into the gulf of pleasure without difficulty, till I was obliged to withdraw the grasp my hand held on it. I had hardly done so when I saw the enormous pillar entirely swallowed up, and on turning my eyes to Frank's face, I could not discover on his countenance the slightest trace of pain or suffering. Satisfied that I need have no further apprehension on his account, I turned myself a little round, so as to take my part in the play, and placing myself directly before him, so as to bring my buttocks in contact with his warm, soft belly, I insinuated Frank's charming little darling into my rear. While holding me fast with one arm round the middle, he grasped my stiffly erected standard with the other hand, thinking that the power and weight of metal of Sir Charles' performer in the rear would prevent Frank from exerting himself much in the combat. I resolved to render any great exertion on his part unnecessary. For keeping time with Sir Charles' motions, I commenced a series of heaves by which, whenever Sir Charles' weapon was well, fully driven up to the hilt in his hinder quarter, his own was as fully and displeasantly introduced within me. This delightful operation very soon produced such a state of ecstatic delirium that he could not refrain from giving vent to the most enthusiastic praises of our performances in such a loud tone, that I was obliged to beg him to be quiet to prevent suspicion being aroused. The delight was too excessive to endure long, and before Sir Charles was ready to perform his part in the final scene, I felt the dear boy's discharge poured into me, as his head sank upon my back and his convulsive grasp of my throbbing instrument relaxed. I retained him in this position for a few seconds longer while the fierce heaves of Sir Charles, driving his steed to and fro in the delicious field of battle, testified to the soul-stirring effect that had been produced upon him, and soon relieved his high-mettled charger of a portion of his superabundant fluid. Then withdrawing from Frank, he laid him down on the bed, and again renewed his caresses, which very soon reanimated the slightly drooping head of his darling charmer. We agreed, however, that it would be better to allow Frank to be passive in the next encounter, and accordingly I took the center position, and entering Frank's delicious rear, I exposed my own to be breached by the enormous battering ram of Sir Charles. The assault, however, was not nearly so terrible, and with a little care I now contrived to take it all in, and speedily enjoyed the felicity of feeling its throbbing pulsation beating within me over the whole extent of the cavity which it so completely filled up. Frank's charming receptacle for my own heaving instrument was of that pleasing elasticity that I should not have discovered it, had ever rock once been invaded by a larger weapon than my own, and the voluptuous sensations it produced upon my burning member as, excited to the highest pitch and swollen to the utmost extension, the fiery dart was plunged in and out of the burning furnace were most exquisite. I felt, too, the full effect which Frank had already experienced of the greatly increased pleasure during the amorous encounter which resulted from the pressure in the interior of so large an instrument as that of Sir Charles. And much as I had enjoyed my former encounters with them both separately, most assuredly this one, in which they both combined their utmost efforts to produce the most lascivious sensations it is possible to conceive far surpassed everything that had taken place previously. Another scene of delicious toying succeeded, 
The darling objects, which had already given us so much delight, were again investigated and admired. And each new proof of the bliss they were capable of conferring upon us only made us more eager to offer up our worship to them. Another delicious combat succeeded. Sir Charles this time took the combat position, and I again received his member within me. But my concern being now well saturated with the blissful libations that had been already poured into it, the monster slipped into me this time with very little difficulty. Frank, on the other hand, was delighted as well as surprised to discover that he had no easy task to force his way into the agreeable fortress he was about to storm in Sir Charles' rear. But the difficulty only enhanced the pleasure when the breach was fairly made, and the invader reveled in full and undisputed possession of the interior works. And if I might judge from the exclamations of delight, they both enjoyed themselves to their hearts' content when they had once gained admission to their respective destinations. So much so that after they had run one course, they gave no signs of wishing to change their position. I put my hand behind to ascertain the state of matters and found both the heroes still in such an excited condition that I said if they were disposed to break another. Lance in the same lists, I was quite willing to keep my place, provided Sir Charles would take my charger in hand and lead him on to participate in the pleasing conflict. This proposal was highly approved of and at once carried into effect to the entire satisfaction of all parties. After this, I made Sir Charles leave us not wishing that we should be entirely worked out as I was quite aware poor Laura would be in a sad state if she found him, that we were unable to do anything in the way of appeasing her longings after the excitement she must have undergone while witnessing our voluptuous proceedings. As soon as he was gone, Laura made her appearance and scolded us heartily for having wasted so much of our precious strength and enjoyed ourselves so completely without her. But as we each contrived to give her pretty satisfactory proof that we had not spent all our treasures, we soon put her in a good humor again, especially as Sir Charles was to leave on the next day, when she would have us all to herself again. In the course of the day, I easily persuaded Sir Charles to allow me to take likenesses of us all three in the various attitudes of enjoying each other, one of which I took care should be sealed up and deposited where Laura would have it at command in the event of her finding it necessary to have recourse to it, even if I should not be at hand at the time. As Sir Charles was obliged after this to be almost constantly absent, we gave up to him the few nights he occasionally spent at the hall, and the remainder were passed, with Laura in a constant series of repetitions of delightful sports, which, however agreeable to the actors, would involve a tiresome repetition were I to detail them. The only variety was Frank's adventure with Betsy. Having been once accustomed to indulge his passions, he regretted sadly that the enjoyment would continue only for so short a period. As Laura and her Charles were to go abroad immediately on their marriage, and he began to look about him for some object to console him in her absence, he soon fixed upon Betsy, but he found it more difficult to obtain her consent than he had expected. When I joked her on the subject, she admitted that she liked the boy, but said she was afraid he was too young to give her much pleasure, while there was a great risk that he might talk of it and get her into a scrape. Finding that Frank was very desirous to have her, I agreed to promote his wishes. I had endeavored to conceal as much as possible from Betsy my intercourse with Laura, but she was too quick not to have discovered that there existed a good understanding between us. Though I still pretended that, although we were sometimes in the habit of amusing ourselves together after her old fashion, she had not yet granted me the last favor. I now told her that Laura had discovered my intercourse with her, and that previous to her own marriage she wished to see us perform the thou, conjugal rites that she might know how to conduct herself when it came to be her turn, and that I had therefore arranged. As Frank was to be out early the next morning, Laura was to come to my room, where I had promised that Betsy and I should comply with her wishes. Frank got one of his sister's caps which concealed his hair, and a nightshirt which closed in front over his breast, and it was hardly possible for anyone to tell that it was not Laura herself. Indeed, the disguise was so complete that the next time Sir Charles came to enjoy himself with us, I made Frank dress up in the same manner and pretend to be asleep in bed with me. 
and it was only when I could not restrain a burst of laughter at his consternation that Sir Charles discovered the trick we played him. Nor do I think he was perfectly satisfied until the removal of Frank's shirt showed standing proof that it did not cover a woman's form. Betsy's discovery was made in a different manner. When she came, Frank kept under the bedclothes until I had stripped her, and getting into bed with her performed the hymenial rites in due order. When we had finished, I slipped off her on the other side of the bed from Frank, leaving her lying on her back all exposed to his observation. He commenced a survey of every part of her, joking her on the beauties he discovered, and on the manner in which she had enjoyed the operation that had just been performed, and wondering whether it would give her as much satisfaction. Gradually he began to embrace her, and at last got upon her, asking me if that was the way Sir Charles would do it to her. Yes, that is it, said I, as he got between her thighs and placed himself in the position in which I had lately been. Only he would not have this stupid nightdress about him, and he'll have something stiff between his legs to put into that pretty little hole you see before you. Now try what you can do to imitate him. While Frank clasped her in his arms and pressed his mouth to hers, I raised his shirt, and pointing his weapon at the mark, he thrust himself forward, and it slipped into her in an instant. Betsy's consternation was extreme, as she felt the warm flesh within her. She had on many occasions tried the effect of Laura's substitute, but her experience of the real article had been quite enough to satisfy her that this was something of a different description and she exclaimed, Goodness gracious, Miss Laura, what is the meaning of this? Frank replied, tearing off his cap and exhibiting his short curls instead of Laura's flowing ringlets. Well, I am glad I have got something to prove I am not a girl, for I was beginning to be afraid that the change of dress had effected a complete transformation. It was too late for any objection now, nor did Betsy appear at all disposed to make any. On the contrary, the lascivious boy's motions were so lively and so well directed, and his capacity for conferring pleasure so much greater than she had expected that she at once yielded herself up to the enjoyment, and joined in his amorous transports with hearty goodwill. And when he had given and drawn from her the first proof of their mutual satisfaction with each other, and the young rogue still retained his position, and woe. Well, proceeded to give her a second dose of his prolific balm. She was quite transported with delight, and exerted herself with so much vigor, and set to second his, endeavors that they very soon sank exhausted in each other's, arms enjoying to the utmost the second proof of the completion of their mutual overwhelming bliss. But these hours of happiness were too delightful to last long. The day appointed for the marriage came upon us before we could believe it possible. Though sorely against my will, I thought it right to suggest to Laura whether it would not be prudent that she should pass the last night of her presumed virgin state without having her inmost recesses explored for fear of any traces being left. But though she at first agreed that this precaution would be advisable, she could not make up her mind to put it in practice. To our surprise and joy, she came to us as usual, as soon as she was left alone for the night, unwilling to run the risk of her appearing fatigued and exhausted in the morning, we resolved to concentrate our forces upon her and take our farewell that night. Time after time we kept up the amorous combat, sometimes in succession, and sometimes combining our forces for a joint attack, both in front and rear, almost without intermission, until we were fairly exhausted and it was only when after repeated engagements even her fond caresses failed to revive our enervated champions that, taking an affectionate farewell, she retired to her own apartment. The exercise so far from injuring seemed to have a beneficial effect on her charms, and never had she looked more lovely than she appeared the next morning when she was transferred to the arms of the enraptured Sir Charles. Most fortunately, everything turned out eventually, even more agreeably than we had ventured to hope. A few days afterwards I had the gratification of hearing from Laura that she had satisfactorily put in operation the device I had suggested, which combined with the difficulty Sir Charles experienced, from his great size in obtaining an entrance, and the pain she pretended to experience, 
when he forced his way within her supposed virgin sanctuary, completely prevented any suspicion on his part. And loving her as I did, I was pleased with her frank avowal that not only his general conduct and kindness left her nothing to wish for, but that in her nuptial intercourse with him she derived, if possible, even greater pleasure than she enjoyed with us. The symptoms which had alarmed us passed off without producing the dreaded consequence, and it was not till some weeks after the usual time had elapsed that she presented the delighted Sir Charles with a son who was soon followed by numerous successors. Frank before long joined the army, and in the arms of others soon found consolation, though he never forgot the charms of his first instructors. When Laura and I met again, we could not refrain from renewing our old delights and comparing the changes which had taken place in each other's charms. But with the exception of one single occasion, I believe I am the only one she ever allowed to participate with her husband in the pleasures she was so well calculated to confer. After the marriage I got alarmed about Betsy, and regretted that I had allowed her to know so much as she did. The only remedy I could devise was to persuade her to go to a distant country where she would have no temptation to speak on the subject. On sounding her, I found that, trusting to the influence she thought she had obtained over Frank and me, she was not disposed to be removed from us. I therefore had recourse to John, and found him not only much more intelligent, but also more sensible than his mistress. I had not much difficulty in convincing him that if he had the means of settling in Australia, he was much more likely to prosper there than by continuing in service in this country. As a further inducement and a reason why I took an interest in them, I told him I had discovered that Frank had taken a fancy for Betsy and that, though there was no reason to suppose anything had occurred, it would be better they should be separated. He was quite of the same opinion, and as the consequences of the operations of some one of us upon Betsy threatened, in a short time to become apparent, he made it a condition of their marriage that she should emigrate with him. As I had a strong suspicion that I had at least dug out the foundation, if not laid the cornerstone, of the structure which Betsy was about to rear, I took care they should have the means to settle comfortably, and from his knowledge in horse breeding, John soon prospered there. Very soon after their arrival in the colony, and precisely at the expiration of the usual period for my first entrance within her, she presented her husband with a son. She never had another child. Finesse.